This is Audible. Wiley Audio is pleased to present Common Sense on Mutual Funds, New Imperatives for the Intelligent Investor, by John C. Bogle. Your reader is Grover Gardner. Chapter 1 On Long-Term Investing Investing is an act of faith. We entrust our capital to corporate stewards in the faith, at least with the hope, that their efforts will generate high rates of return on our investments. When we purchase corporate America's stocks and bonds, we are professing our faith that the long-term success of the U.S. economy and the nation's financial markets will continue in the future. When we invest in a mutual fund, we are expressing our faith that the professional managers of the fund will be vigilant stewards of the assets we entrust to them. We are also recognizing the value of diversification by spreading our investments over a large number of stocks and bonds. A diversified portfolio minimizes the risk inherent in owning any individual security by shifting that risk to the level of the stock and bond markets. America's faith in investing has waxed and waned, kindled by bull markets and chilled by bear markets, but it has remained intact. It has survived the Great Depression, two world wars, the rise and fall of communism, and a barrage of unnerving changes, booms and bankruptcies, inflation and deflation, shocks in commodity prices, the revolution in information technology, and the globalization of financial markets. In recent years, our faith has been enhanced, perhaps excessively so, by the bull market in stocks that began in 1982 and has accelerated, without significant interruption, toward the century's end. As we approach the millennium, confidence in equities is at an all-time high. Might some unforeseeable economic shock trigger another depression so severe that it would destroy our faith in the promise of investing? Perhaps. Excessive confidence in smooth seas can blind us to the risk of storms. History is replete with episodes in which the enthusiasm of investors has driven equity prices to, and even beyond the point at which they are swept into a whirlwind of speculation, leading to unexpected losses. There is little certainty in investing. As long-term investors, however, we cannot afford to let the apocalyptic possibilities frighten us away from the markets for without risk, there is no return. The alternative to long-term investing is a short-term approach to the stock and bond markets. Countless examples from the financial media and the actual practices of professional and individual investors demonstrate that short-term investment strategies are inherently dangerous. In these current ebullient times, large numbers of investors are subordinating the principles of sound long-term investing to the frenetic short-term action that pervades our financial markets. Their counterproductive attempts to trade stocks and funds for short-term advantage and to time the market, jumping aboard when the market is expected to rise, bailing out in anticipation of a decline, are resulting in the rapid turnover of investment portfolios that ought to be designed to seek long-term goals. We are not able to control our investment returns, but a long-term investment program, fortified by faith in the future, benefits from careful attention to those elements of investing that are within our power to control. Risk, cost, and time. The financial media provide a good place to begin our review of the eternal search for market-beating returns, whether through market timing or other means. The media reflect the actions of the financial markets, which are determined by the investment decisions made by all investors. The media also magnify the impact of market actions by highlighting, and in some respects sensationalizing them. Consider two covers from Business Week, one of our nation's most respected business periodicals. On August 13, 1979, Business Week ran a cover story called The Death of Equities, The story's timing could hardly have been more unfortunate. 
The Dow Jones Industrial Average of stock prices was at 840 when the article was written. It rose to 960 by the end of 1980. In the next two years, the index declined. It scraped 800 in July 1982, but then rebounded to 1200 by May 1983. Business Week then ran another cover story called The Rebirth of Equities. On May 9, 1983, after the near 50% market rise that had ensued since the August 1979 article. After the publication of the 1983 article, I said to one of my colleagues, Watch out, the fun is over. And the equity market fun was sidetracked, if only for a while. Business Week said sell when the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 840, and buy after it had climbed to 1200. Yet two years after the buy recommendation, in May 1985, the Dow still languished at about 1,200. It may be unfair to single out these Business Week classics. Time gave us an equally poignant example of the hazards of taking strong and unequivocal stands on the future course of the stock market. In its September 26, 1988 issue, Time ran a cover story titled, Buy Stocks? No Way! The cover pictured an enormous bear. The article included these pearls of wisdom about the stock market. It's a dangerous game. It's a vote of confidence that things are getting worse. The market has become a crapshoot. The small investor has become an endangered species. The stock market is one of the sleaziest enterprises in the world. When those words were published, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at the 2000 level, down from the peak of 2700 reached just before the market crash of October 1987. Since then, the Dow has topped 9,000, greater than a fourfold increase. Investors who acted on Time's conclusion would have sat mournfully on the sidelines through one of history's most powerful bull markets. I intend neither to slam Business Week and Time nor to offer them as the perfect contrary indicators, those wonderful sources whose advice is so consistently wrong that we can count on profits simply by doing the opposite. My point is... The market is simply unpredictable on any short-term, month-to-month, or even year-to-year -year basis. We should not expect it to be predictable, nor should we base our investment decisions on impulses inspired by the conventional wisdom of the day. Whether they come in large headlines in respected publications or arise from our own daily hopes and fears, these calls to action generally have a short-term focus that muddles our view of the long-term. Unfortunately, the available data suggests that, rather than ignoring the impulses engendered by the press or by emotional responses to market swings, the individual mutual fund shareholder responds to them with alacrity and follows the crowd. Mutual fund investing has proved to be extremely market-sensitive, as fund shareholders overreact to fluctuations in stock prices. The stock market crash of October 1987 caused many otherwise rational investors to abandon the stock market. But as soon as the bull market resumed its rampage, these same investors changed their course again. Cash flows into equity funds resumed in full force and remained positive in each quarter through mid-1998. What began as a tiny trickle became a roaring river. Net purchases of $1 billion in 1983, the first full year of the bull market, multiplied more than 200 times and reached $219 billion in 1997. If massive mutual fund inflows and outflows from investors remain contrary indicators, the industry's recent cash inflows may not be good news. But whatever the future may hold, these figures are one more manifestation of one of the great paradoxes of the stock market. When stock prices are high, investors want to jump on the bandwagon. When stocks are on the bargain counter, it is difficult to give them away. It is not only in their love-hate relationship with equity funds that investors reflect their short-term orientation. They have come to adopt another short-term strategy, rapid turnover of their equity fund holdings. The tendency of investors to follow high turnover policies in their own mutual fund portfolios has reached staggering proportions. No doubt fund investors came by this short-term philosophy honestly. They learned it from the portfolio managers who run the funds they own. 
From the 1940s to the mid-1960s, annual portfolio turnover of the typical general equity fund averaged a modest 17%. In 1997, average turnover of U.S. equity funds stood at 85%, an amazing five-fold increase. Portfolio managers, on average, were holding the stocks in their portfolios for only slightly longer than one year. It was odd behavior for investment advisors, who are entrusted with the fiduciary responsibility to manage clients' assets prudently. Instead, they were shuffling through their portfolios like short-term speculators. During the past few decades, abetted by the proliferation of sophisticated communications technologies, Portfolio managers of other people's money have adopted a new method to try to beat the market. Rapid-fire trading, a practice that can burden investors with enormous portfolio transaction costs, as well as staggering tax costs. As Columbia Law School professor Louis Lowenstein expressed it in a 1998 article, mutual fund managers exhibit a persistent emphasis on momentary stock prices. The subtleties and nuances of a particular business utterly escape them. Despite the example set by some of what I describe as the best practice mutual funds, those that follow relatively steady low turnover policies, the mutual fund industry pursues a far less productive path. Fund managers also ignore the lesson of long-term investing set by Warren Buffett, without doubt America's most successful investment manager. The turnover in his huge portfolio, limited to a relative handful of stocks, is not only low, it is virtually non-existent. One might well ask, why should any fiduciary behave differently from the Buffett principles? Mr. Buffett describes his extraordinarily productive investment approach as keeping most of our major holdings, regardless of how they are priced relative to current intrinsic business value, a till-death-do-us-part attitude. We are searching for operations that we believe are virtually certain to possess enormous strengths ten or twenty years from now. As investors, our reaction to a fermenting industry is much like our attitude toward space exploration. We applaud the endeavor, but prefer to skip the ride. Mr. Buffett doesn't cotton to the high turnover that characterizes mutual funds. Investment managers are even more kinetic. Their behavior makes whirling dervishes appear sedated by comparison. Indeed, the term institutional investor is becoming one of those self-contradictions called an oxymoron, comparable to jumbo shrimp, lady mud wrestler, and inexpensive lawyer. Given this situation as it exists in the modern mutual fund industry, Mr. Buffett quickly comes to the correct conclusion. An investor who does not understand the economics of specific companies but wishes to be a long-term owner of American industry, he says, should periodically invest in an index fund. In this way, the know-nothing investor can actually outperform most investment professionals. Paradoxically, when dumb money acknowledges its limitations, it ceases to be dumb. Money invested for the long term, like the proverbial plodding tortoise, wins the race over speculative money, analogous to the fits and starts of the hare. The mutual fund industry is ignoring this truism. Let's consider whether the fund industry's rapid turnover might possibly be the side effect of well-executed plans for earning superior investment returns. The obvious answer is, for the industry as a whole, it cannot be. Now controlling one-third of all stocks, fund managers are largely trading, not with other investors, but with one another. Thus, each trade balances out for fund shareholders as a group. It is a zero-sum game. But, importantly, money is left on the table for the dealers executing the trades, meaning that the activity becomes a negative-sum game. The evidence confirms this conclusion. A recent study by Morningstar found that few managers were able to improve returns significantly through portfolio turnover, but that on balance, the tiny increases in return that turnover might have engendered were gained only by buying riskier stocks. The study hardly serves as an encouraging defense of the industry's high turnover policies. Further, my own, admittedly anecdotal studies over the years suggest that the Morningstar results may be too optimistic. 
The evidence that I have seen shows that the overwhelming majority of funds would earn higher returns each year if they simply held their portfolios static at the beginning of the year and took no action whatsoever during the ensuing 12 months. Whatever the cause, professional managers have fallen further behind the market averages with today's high turnover practices than with the low turnover practices that were long an industry hallmark. I suggest that the high costs imposed by their manic trading are in part responsible for this growing gap. In this exceedingly creative industry, we will no doubt witness the development of countless new short-term strategies, each with an alluring but ultimately vacant promise that hyperactive short-term management of a long-term investment portfolio can generate better results than a sensible buy-and-hold approach. Market timing has thus far been a singular failure, and the rapid turnover of investment portfolios has been no more effective. As costly and tax-inefficient turnover accelerates, for funds and fund investors alike, this practice seems destined to become ever more damaging. In my view, market timing and rapid turnover, both by and for mutual fund investors, betray both a lack of understanding of the economics of investing and an infatuation with the process of investing. As I shall make clear in Chapter 2, the source of long-term financial market returns is easily explained. For the stock market, corporate earnings and dividends. For the bond market, interest payments. Market returns, however, are calculated before the deduction of the costs of investing and are most assuredly not based on speculation and rapid trading, which do nothing but shift returns from one investor to another. For the long-term investor, returns have everything to do with the underlying economics of corporate America and very little to do with the mechanical process of buying and selling pieces of paper. The art of investing in mutual funds, I would argue, rests on simplicity and common sense. If individual stocks derive their value from the businesses that issue them, then the broad stock market obviously represents not a mere collection of paper stock certificates, but the tangible and intangible net assets of American business in the aggregate. Before taking costs into account, investors will inevitably earn long-term returns that approximate the earnings and dividends produced by corporate America. Rapid turnover can ultimately produce no value for investors as a group, for it does nothing to increase the level of corporate earnings and dividends. Nor can market timing have any effect on the intrinsic value of corporate America. The ideal for the long-term investor remains a sensible balance of stocks and bonds held through the market seasons of growth and decline. Although most investors have yet to embrace the ideal of long-term investing, it is surprisingly easy to achieve. In the real world of mutual funds, intelligent investors must pay attention to the elements of long-term investing that are within their power to control. No matter how difficult or how much easier said than done, they must focus not on the market's short-term direction, nor on finding the next hot fund, but on intelligent fund selection. The key to fund selection is to focus not on future return, which the investor cannot control, but on risk, cost, and time, all of which the investor can control. Just as the garden's fledgling shoots develop slowly and blossom over the course of a season, with their roots strengthening over years, investment success takes time. Give yourself all the time you can. Begin to invest in your twenties, even if you invest only a small amount. Nourished by the miracle of compound interest, your portfolio should flourish with the market's passing cycles. Over a ten-year period, for example, if market returns average a nominal 10% annually, an initial investment of $10,000 will grow to almost $26,000, more than two and a half times the initial investment. Assuming a real return of 7%, the terminal value would represent a near doubling of your initial purchasing power. In 50 years, assuming the same 10% return, $10,000 would grow to almost $1.2 million or 120 times the initial investment. To exploit the full power of compounding in real markets, pay particular attention to the negative implications of cost, the cost of investment advice, portfolio management and administration, buying and selling investments, and taxes. 
By the end of the period over which you accumulate your retirement nest egg, the returns earned in individual diversified portfolios are almost sure to lag behind those of the markets in which they invest in direct proportion to the expenses and taxes they incur. Superficially small differences in annual returns extended over long periods of time will make a dramatic difference in how much capital you finally accumulate. Give your portfolio plenty of time to benefit from the magic of compounding and minimize the costs you incur. Never forget that costs, like weeds, impede the garden's growth. These simple principles are the basis of a long-term investment strategy that should reward investors' faith in the promise of investing. Most mutual fund investors who deviate from the long-term investing ideal are rewarded only with dashed expectations. The relentless pursuit of unrealistic performance, practiced through costly short-term strategies, distracts them from one of the most important secrets of investment success, simplicity. As they complicate the process, they increase the likelihood of stumbling down an ill-lit path to disappointment. Follow a simple plan and let the cycles of the market take their course. The secret of investing is, finally, that there is no secret. We have had a long spring and summer, the longest sustained equity bull market in history. But there are also fall and winter. Don't be surprised when the season changes, for change it will. Indeed, that time may now be in prospect. In the long run, however, your investments will survive and prosper if you rely on a few simple rules. Invest you must. The biggest risk is the long-term risk of not putting your money to work at a generous return, not the short-term, but nonetheless real, risk of price volatility. Time is your friend. Give yourself all the time you can. Begin to invest in your twenties, even if it's only a small amount, and never stop. Even modest investments in tough times will help you sustain the pace and will become a habit. Compound interest is a miracle. Impulse is your enemy. Eliminate emotion from your investment program. Have rational expectations about future returns and avoid changing those expectations as the seasons change. Cold, dark winters will give way to bright, bountiful springs. Basic arithmetic works. Keep your investment expenses under control. Your net return is simply the gross return of your investment portfolio, less the costs you incur. Sales commissions, advisory fees, transaction costs. Low costs make your task easier. Stick to simplicity. Don't complicate the process. Basic investing is simple. A sensible asset allocation to stocks, bonds, and cash reserves. A selection of middle-of-the-road funds that emphasize high-grade securities. A careful balancing of risk, return, and, lest we forget, cost. Stay the course. No matter what happens, stick to your program. I've said stay the course a thousand times, and I meant it every time. It is the most important single piece of investment wisdom I can give to you. Let the brief and uncertain years roll by and face the future with faith. Perhaps a future winter will be longer and colder than usual, or a summer will be drier and hotter. In the long run, however, our economy and our financial markets are stable and rational. Don't let short-run fluctuations, market psychology, false hope, fear, and greed get in the way of good investment judgment. Chapter 2. On the Nature of Returns Occam's Razor The preacher Ecclesiastes said, There is no remembrance of things past, neither shall there be remembrance of things to come. That philosophy is doubtless sound for investors concerned about the erratic, unpredictable, short-term volatility in the U.S. financial markets. But in developing a long-term investment strategy, remembering the past is essential because it can help us to understand the forces that drive security prices. When we subject financial realities to reasoned analysis, we gain insights into the sources and patterns of the long-term returns produced by stocks and bonds in the past. Those insights can provide a sound basis for determining the nature of future returns. What is more, they can form the basis for rational discourse about investing in the years ahead. 
Sir William of Ockham, a 14th century British philosopher, is responsible for the insight that the simpler the explanation, the more likely it is to be correct. This postulate has come to be known as Occam's Razor, and I have used it in the analytical methodology with which I approach the financial markets. Wielding Sir William's Razor, I have shorn my methodology of all complication, pairing the sources of investment return down to three essential components. This analysis takes into account my conviction both that the performance of individual securities is unpredictable and that the performance of portfolios of securities is unpredictable on any short-term basis. While the long-term performance of portfolios is also unpredictable, a careful examination of the past returns can help establish some probabilities about the prospective parameters of return, offering intelligent investors a basis for rational expectations about future returns. The application of Occam's razor to the financial markets is most appropriate for investors who select broadly diversified mutual funds run at modest cost and who hold them for the long term. The full market returns presented in this chapter reflect gross returns, but investors as a group inevitably earn less. Recall the discussion of investment costs in Chapter 1. So whatever market returns we expect, we must reduce them by up to two percentage points or more to account for those costs. Because long-term investment returns are conventionally measured by market indexes tracking the broad U.S. stock and bond markets, my analysis has the greatest direct relevance to index funds that follow these same benchmarks. Diversified stock funds that emphasize corporations with large market capitalizations, along with funds investing in high-grade bonds, also fit nicely into this analysis. In both cases, the gap between fund returns and market returns is minimized by those funds that have the lowest costs. So, courtesy of Occam's razor, I advance a simple theory. These variables determine stock market returns over the long term. The dividend yield at the time of initial investment, the subsequent rate of growth in earnings, the change in the price-earnings ratio during the period of investment. The total of these three components explains nearly all of the stock market's returns over extended holding periods. By analyzing the contribution to total return of the three factors, reasoned consideration of future returns can take place. The initial dividend yield is a known quantity. The rate of earnings growth has usually been relatively predictable within fairly narrow parameters. And the change in the price-earnings ratio has proven highly speculative. Total return is simply the sum of these three factors. For example, an initial dividend yield of, say, 3% plus a forecasted earnings growth of 7% annually over the next 10 years would bring the return to 10%. A change in the price-earnings ratio from, say, 15 times at the beginning of the period to a forecasted 18 times at the end would add two percentage points to that total, bringing the return on stocks to 12%. The Occam's Razor approach to the components of return echoes the philosophy of John Maynard Keynes, perhaps the most influential economist of the 20th century. Keynes posited these sources of financial returns. Investment, which he called enterprise. The activity of forecasting the prospective yield on the asset over its whole life, assuming that the existing state of affairs will continue indefinitely. Speculation. The activity of forecasting the psychology of the market, attaching hopes to a favorable change in the conventional basis of valuation. In our Occam's Razor model, the combination of initial dividend yield and prospective 10-year earnings growth, the two investment fundamentals, is the analog for the Keynesian concept of enterprise, the estimated yield of the asset over its lifetime. The change in price-earning ratios is the analog for speculation, a change in the basis of valuation, or a barometer of investor sentiment. Investors pay more for earnings when their expectations are high and less when they lose faith in the future. When stocks are priced at a multiple of 21 times earnings or higher, the mood is exuberance. At seven times earnings, the mood approaches despair. After all, the price-earnings ratio simply represents the price paid for a dollar of earnings. But as the valuation falls from 21 to 7 times earnings, prices fall by 67 percent. 
If the reverse occurs, prices increase by 200%. If there is no change in the price-earnings ratio, the total return on stocks depends almost entirely on the initial dividend yield and the rate of earnings growth. In short, the fundamentals of investment, dividends and earnings growth, are the right things to remember about things past. In the very long run, the role of speculation has proven to be a neutral factor in the shaping of returns. Speculation cannot feed on itself forever. Periods in which speculation has enhanced returns have been followed by periods in which speculation has diminished returns. No matter how compelling or even predominant the impact of speculation on return is in the short run, expecting it to repeat itself leads our expectations down the wrong road. Speculation is the wrong thing to remember as we peer into the future to consider things yet to come. The point of this analytical exercise is pragmatic. If there are favorable odds of making reasonably accurate long-term projections of investment returns, and if fundamental returns, earnings and dividends, are the dominant force in shaping the long-term returns that actually transpire, would not a strategy focused on those fundamental factors be more likely to be successful than a strategy of speculation for the investor with a long-term time horizon? Short-term investment strategies, which effectively ignore dividend yield and earnings growth, both of which are virtually inconsequential in a period of weeks or months, have almost nothing to do with investment, but they have a lot to do with speculation. That is, simply guessing at the price that other investors might be willing to pay for a diversified portfolio of stocks or bonds at some future time when we are willing to sell. I make no apology for Occam's razor, nor for the simplicity of my three-step concept of evaluating returns, even as I realize, quoting Renoir, nothing is as disconcerting as simplicity. To which I might add, nothing is as futile as expecting past returns to be slavishly translated into future returns on a linear basis. Too many of the complex academic investment strategies and forecasting methodologies appearing in the financial journals are entirely retrospective and, often, entirely dependent on the particular period chosen. Some of them approach witchcraft. The simplicity postulated by Occam's razor can help cut through much of the confusion that clutters investment theory. It presents a simple and rational picture of future possibilities, based largely on the lessons we can learn from the study of past returns and our view of the elements of future returns. Occam's razor will not tell us what future returns will be, but it will tell us what the elements of stock and bond returns must be to provide us with any rate of return we wish to assume. You are free to disagree with my conclusions, particularly because, to reiterate, we know that anything can happen in the financial markets, and it usually does. There is no reason for slavish adherence to even a rational forecasting methodology, for markets are not always rational. Judgment is not only permitted, but encouraged. But the thrust of the theoretical exercise we have now completed is that disagreement must be fact-founded and data-based, not merely intuitive. Going through the Occam's Razor exercise should help investors make intelligent decisions about where to invest their assets. If we focus on the fundamentals of investment and ignore the dross of speculation, we come to the same conclusion reached by Warren Buffett. In the short run, the stock market is a voting machine. In the long run, it is a weighing machine. There is no way for investors to avoid thinking about the future course of the financial markets. In this chapter, I have tried, above all, to put into perspective the forces that drive market returns. They are worth knowing and understanding. But we must face the reality that, even if rational analysis of the relationship between investment fundamentals and speculation in investing gives us favorable odds, and no more than that, of accurately forecasting market returns, the game may not be worth the candle for the long-term investor. After all, we would be foolish to take our investment portfolios to the betting window and wager everything on a single race, even if the odds were eight out of ten, to say nothing of five and a half out of ten, in our favor. Peter Bernstein and Robert Arnott, 
reflected on this question in a recent article in the Journal of Portfolio Management. Bull market? Bear market? Should you really care? They concluded that, for most long-term investors, bull markets are not nearly as beneficial and bear markets not nearly as damaging as most investors seem to think. They noted, correctly, that a bull market raises the asset value but delivers a proportionate reduction in the prospective real yields that the portfolio can deliver from that point forward, while a bear market does the reverse, reducing portfolio value, which is largely offset by an increase in prospective yields, other things being equal. This being the case, what we would ideally like to see is a bull market late in the lives of our portfolios and a bear market during the early years of accumulating them. But that's a bit of timing beyond our control. Those who believe that the market's incredible momentum will be sustained, that the huge sustained purchases of stocks by individual investors will not slacken, and that we are indeed in a new era of global growth, will hold the line in their equity allocation, or perhaps even increase it. But those who believe, as I do, that fundamentals such as earnings and dividends matter, and that in the fullness of time some semblance of historic norms will prevail, should consider at least some modest leaning against the powerful wind that is driving the high returns in this great bull market. And those who believe that another great crash lies around the corner must consider an even larger reduction of their equity exposures. Irrespective of what the future holds, however, it seems to me that equities should remain the investment of choice for the long-term investor, the dominant component of a well-balanced asset allocation program. So, invest with intelligence and common sense. Engage in an enlightened and rational discourse when considering the future. Always have some significant portion of your assets both in stocks and in bonds. Be sparing about precipitate and extreme changes in these proportions. And be skeptical about every prognostication you are given, including mine. If you have set an intelligent route toward capital accumulation, stay the course, no matter what. With a bow to Occam's razor and the role of simple concepts, I hope I have given you a better understanding of what is fundamental and what is transitory, what is investment and what is speculation, to help you come to a rational expectation of the range of returns that both stocks and bonds can provide over the long term. Now, we can get down to the most basic element of long-term investment strategy, the allocation of our investments between stocks and bonds. Chapter 3. On Asset Allocation. The Riddle of Performance Attribution. We invest with faith in the financial markets, dividing our portfolios among distinct asset classes that blossom and wither in different seasons of the economic cycle. Following the simple logic of diversification, we seek to maximize our participation in the market's seasons of plenty while ensuring that we survive its seasons of want. For nearly all investors, the principal asset classes of choice boil down to common stocks for maximum total return, bonds for reasonable income, and cash reserves for stability of principal. Each differs in risk. Stocks are the most volatile, bonds are less so, and the nominal value of cash reserves is inviolable. In the past 25 years, we have come to frame the simple logic of diversification in terms of a rigorous statistical model developed by finance academics, modern portfolio theory. Investors almost universally accept this theory, which is based on developing investment portfolios that seek returns that optimize the investor's willingness to assume risk. Risk, in turn, is defined in terms of short-term fluctuations in expected value. In its most comprehensive form, modern portfolio theory dictates that portfolio composition should include all liquid asset classes, not only U.S. stocks, bonds, and cash reserves, but international investments, short positions, foreign exchange, and various curios, gold, for example, from the financial marketplace. Such a range may be theoretically attractive, but the basic concept need not be so complex. Indeed, more than 14 centuries ago, the Talmud prescribed this simple asset allocation strategy. A man should always keep his wealth in three forms, one-third in real estate, another in merchandise, and the remainder in liquid assets. 
My advice is not much different from what is recommended in that ancient body of Jewish tradition and law. Rather than real estate and merchandise, however, my focus is on the marketable securities for an investment portfolio, stocks and bonds. For simplicity's sake, I omit cash reserves, such as money market funds, from the equation. Because they tend to deliver very modest returns, such reserves should be considered as savings for short-term and emergency needs, not as investment for long-term capital accumulation. For investors, short-term bonds are a superior alternative to money market funds. Short-term bonds are relatively insensitive to interest rate fluctuations. Long-term bonds are hugely sensitive. Most of the examples presented in this book are based on intermediate-term and long-term bonds. Like the Talmud's asset allocation advice, my guidelines are simple. As a crude starting point, two-thirds in stocks, one-third in bonds. From the day I began my career in this business, I was imbued by my mentor, the late Walter L. Morgan, an industry pioneer and the founder of the Wellington Fund, with the philosophy of portfolio balance. Balance optimizes returns from the stock market in order to reach investment goals, such as the accumulation of assets for retirement, but it holds the risk of loss to tolerable levels by ownership of some bonds, too. Despite, or perhaps because of, the long bull market in stocks that has made balanced investing seem old-fashioned and stodgy to some advisors, I continue to advocate a balanced policy today, with more enthusiasm than ever. My guidelines also respect what I call the four dimensions of investing. One, return. Two, risk. Three, cost. And four, time. When you select your portfolio's long-term allocation to stocks and bonds, you must make a decision about the real returns you can expect to earn and the risks to which your portfolio will be exposed. You must also consider the costs of investing that you will incur. Costs will tend to reduce your return and or increase the risks you must take. Think of return, risk, and cost as the three spatial dimensions, the length, breadth, and width, of a cube. Then think of time as the temporal fourth dimension that interplays with each of the other three. For instance, if your time horizon is long, you can afford to take more risk than if your horizon is short, and vice versa. So far, I've described risk mostly in academic terms, standard deviation or the volatility of monthly or annual returns. In truth, however, risk is something far more difficult to quantify. It relates to how much you can afford to lose without excessive damage to your pocketbook or your psyche. The greatest benefit of a balanced investment program is that it makes risk more palatable. An allocation to bonds moderates the short-term volatility of stocks, giving the risk-averse long-term investor the courage and confidence to sustain a heavy allocation to equities. Choose a balance of stocks and bonds according to your unique circumstances, your investment objectives, your time horizon, your level of comfort with risk, and your financial resources. How can you determine an appropriate balance for your own needs? During the accumulation phase of your personal investment cycle, when you are building assets, you are putting aside money that you would otherwise spend. It's never easy, but always essential. You invest your capital, and you reinvest your dividends and your capital gains distributions. Because you have no immediate need for these assets, you can put your capital at greater risk in pursuit of higher return. As a younger investor, you might allocate as much as 80% or more of your portfolio to stocks, with the remainder in bonds. As the later years of your accumulation phase begin, you are older and you have less time to recoup any decline in the value of your portfolio. At that point, you might limit your stock exposure to no more than 70%. During the distribution phase of your investment cycle, when you enjoy the fruits of the accumulation phase, you depend on a relatively fixed pool of capital to generate income for your needs. You are withdrawing the income generated by your investments, and you cannot afford substantial short-term loss. At the start of the distribution phase, you might reduce your stock allocation to 60% or so. As you age, you might want to cut it to 
even then earning adequate income presents a challenge. In the latter part of 1998, with blue-chip stocks yielding about 1.4 percent and U.S. Treasury bonds yielding about 5.4 percent, a 50-50 balanced market portfolio was providing a yield of 3.3 percent. Given the average operating costs of the typical stock and bond fund, a similar mutual fund portfolio would yield only 2 percent, a reduction of almost 40 percent in your income. This simple calculation reinforces the giant impact of fund costs. The selection of funds in your asset allocation underlines why I repeatedly stress the vital role of fund costs in your investment decision-making process. As you develop your strategic asset allocation, account for your own financial circumstances, your age, your objectives, and your appetite for risk. It would not be imprudent for a highly risk-tolerant young investor, 25 years old or so, who is just beginning to invest for retirement, to allocate everything to stocks, provided that the investor had confidence that regular investments could be made through thick and thin. In the distribution phase, a highly risk-averse older investor who has substantial means could cut the stock allocation to as low as 30%. A key factor in that decision is the relationship between the dollars to be invested and the capital already accumulated. A young investor just beginning with, say, a $150 monthly contribution to an IRA, or corporate-defined contribution pension or thrift plan, has time as an ally and has very little to risk at the outset. An older investor, on the other hand, must consider both the opportunity for return and the hazard of risk on a far larger and more crucial amount of capital. The time is already upon us when a $1 million-plus accumulation in a tax-deferred plan is the standard for an investor who has enjoyed a reasonably rewarding career during 40 years in the workforce. It's grand to possess skill and insight, though all of us tend to overrate our abilities in both areas. But luck, too, plays a role. Many investors are right, but at the wrong time. It does no good to be too early or too late. Tactical asset allocation, if the strategy is used at all, should therefore be used only at the margin. That is, if your optimal strategic allocation is 65% stocks, limit any change to no more than 15 percentage points, 50 to 80% stocks, and implement the change gradually. The prospect of having the skill, insight, and luck to eliminate your stock position overnight and restore it when the time is right is, in my view, patently absurd. Cautious tactical allocation may have a lure for the bold. Full-blown tactical allocation lures only the fool. What might dictate moderate shifts in tactical asset allocation? One example, concern that stocks are substantially overvalued relative to bonds. Then, investors with conviction, courage, and discipline might benefit from a bow toward caution. I say bow, not capitulation. In an inevitably uncertain world, the reduction should not exceed 15 percentage points in your equity position. If you have 65% of your portfolio in equities, retain at least 50%. If 50%, at least 35%, and so on. A little caution may represent simple prudence, and, if you are relatively risk-averse, may enable you to sleep better, a blessing that is hardly trivial. One doesn't have to have investment experience to recognize the wisdom in this saying, from a remarkably parallel field. There are old pilots, and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. An ideal asset allocation incorporates the two most obvious dimensions of investing— risk and return. Investment costs represent a more subtle but equally critical third dimension of investing. The idea that cost rivals asset allocation in importance is not widely shared in the mutual fund industry. After all, with stocks having earned nearly 20% annually in the long bull market and 30% annually in recent years, and with bonds yielding only about 5.5% currently, asset allocation has dwarfed cost in importance. Costs rarely amount to much more than a few percentage points per year. So, industry lore has it that asset allocation must be given the highest priority. By ignoring the impact of costs, the industry implicitly argues that cost doesn't matter. 
industry lore is wrong. The customary perspective for investors is to consider fund expenses as a percentage of assets. In the mutual fund field, the stated expense ratio. These ratios range from 0.2% of assets annually for the lowest cost equity funds, often as it happens market index funds, to 1.5% for the average equity fund, and 2.2% for highest cost equity funds, those in the top quartile in terms of expense ratio. Even the highest of these figures, however, tends to trivialize the impact of cost for the uninitiated. An investor might ask, does a percentage point or so really matter? A second perspective shows that it matters a great deal. Consider expenses as the percentage of an initial investment consumed over a 10-year holding period. Here, the range would be only 2.8% for the lowest cost funds, 19.8% for the average fund, and a healthy, or unhealthy, 28.1% for the highest cost funds. Converting these percentages into dollars may lend even more impact to this perspective. A 0.2% annual cost on an initial investment of $10,000, assuming that the investment appreciated at 5% annually, would cost the investor only $280 over 10 years. But at 2.2%, the 10-year cost would be $2,810. That's real money. As you can imagine, the mutual fund industry is not particularly smitten by this perspective for it brings the cost issue into sharp relief. There is also yet another perspective on cost. Cost as a percentage of the equity risk premium. It provides the most striking perspective of all. To assess the impact of cost on the equity risk premium, let's take a simple example. Assume that the expected return on long-term U.S. Treasury bonds is 6%, and the expected return on stocks is 8.5% the risk premium would be 2.5%. Taking an extreme example, if equities carried a risk premium of 2.5% over long-term U.S. Treasury bonds, and if an equity fund carried a high total cost of 2.5%, say an expense ratio of 2% and transaction costs of 0.5%, the investors would be indifferent in making the choice. Theory would say that the long-term returns of the two investments over time would be identical. There would be no premium for assuming the extra risk. Cost would have consumed 100% of the equity risk premium. Viewed in this light, all of the costs in investing, advisory fees, other fund expenses, and transaction costs, bite into the risk premium. The difference is simply a matter of degree, although at the highest cost levels it is arguably a difference in kind, because it changes the very character of the returns. As you consider the issue of asset allocation and determine your own asset allocation strategy, consider the choices that are available. 1. Annual costs as a percentage of assets managed, the conventional measure. You can pay an expense ratio of 0.2% of assets or one at 2.2% of assets. The choice is yours. 2. Annual costs as a percentage of the total equity return. You can relinquish from 2% to 22% of your annual return. The choice is yours. 3. Cumulative costs as a percentage of the initial capital. You can pay from 2.8% to 28.1% of initial capital over a period of a decade, from $280 to $2,810 on a $10,000 investment. The choice is yours. 4. Annual costs as a percentage of the equity risk premium. This is an important new concept. You can relinquish from 5.7% to 63% of the historical premium norm. Again, the choice is yours. These key alternatives will heavily influence your asset allocation decisions and subsequent investment performance. You need only realize that costs truly matter. This concept must take its proper place as a high priority, not merely an afterthought, as investors decide on the proper strategic asset allocation for their investment portfolios. 
for there proves to be a simple solution to the riddle of performance attribution. Is performance determined by asset allocation or by cost? Common sense gives us the answer to that question, and the data reaffirm it. Both. Chapter 4. On Simplicity. How to Come Down to Where You Ought to Be. Amid the cacophony of advice bombarding you, mine, I imagine, is the most basic. To earn the highest of returns that are realistically possible, you should invest with simplicity. Accepting this reality, that investors as a group will inevitably capture less than 100% of the rates of return provided in any asset class, is the first step toward simplifying the investment decisions. What then is the optimal method of approaching the 100% target and accumulating a substantial investment account? Rely on the ordinary virtues that intelligent, balanced human beings have relied on for centuries. Common sense, thrift, realistic expectations, patience, and perseverance. In investing, I assure you that those characteristics will, over the long run, be rewarded. Where should you begin? Consider that the ultimate in simplicity comes with the additional virtue of low cost. The simplest of all approaches is to invest solely in a single balanced market index fund. Just one fund. And it works. Such a fund offers a broadly diversified middle-of-the-road investment program for a typical conservative investor who is investing about 65% of assets in stocks and 35% in bonds. This portfolio is entirely indexed, that is, its stocks and bonds are not actively managed, but simply represent a broad cross-section of the entire U.S. stock market and bond market. The next chapter explores this concept in considerable depth. Over the past half-century, such a fund would have captured 98% of the rate of return of the combined stock and bond markets. Investing doesn't get much better than that. But if the beginning of simplicity is the index fund, it need not be the end. History suggests that, in the long run, only one of every five actively managed funds is apt to outpace the market index. After taxes, only one of seven. And some simple common-sense principles should help you to select them and to earn a generous portion of the market's return. Again, all too likely less than 100%. If there are long odds against outpacing the market... Going about the task of fund selection intelligently can at least help to guard against a significant failure. Even master investor Warren Buffett, a strong proponent of the index approach, concedes that there may be other ways to construct an investment portfolio. Should you choose to construct your own portfolio, there are a few thoughts worth remembering. Intelligent investing is not complex, though that is far from saying that it is easy. What an investor needs is the ability to correctly evaluate selected businesses. Note the word selected. You don't have to be an expert on every company, or even many. You only have to be able to evaluate companies within your circle of competence. The size of that circle is not very important. Knowing its boundaries, however, is vital. The Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz once said, The greatest enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. And, though I believe that an index strategy is a good strategy, you may want to seek a better plan, if not a perfect plan, no matter how great the challenge, no matter how overpowering the odds against implementing it with extraordinary success. So, much as I would urge you to commit your investments to an all-index fund approach, or at least to follow an approach using index funds as the core of your portfolio, I'm going to offer you another simple approach. Eight basic rules that should help you to capitalize on the advantages that have accounted for the historical ability of an index to provide superior returns. These eight rules are not complex, but they should help you to make intelligent fund selections for your investment program. Rule 1. Select low-cost funds. From much that I hear, I am known as a sort of fringe fanatic an apostle of the message that costs play a crucial role in shaping long-term fund returns. I've said cost matters for so long that one of my followers gave me a plexiglass pillar inscribed with the Latin translation, Pratium Refert. But cost does matter. 
I've shown you the effect on returns and on asset allocation. I've been harping about costs for years, and it was with some delight that I read these words from Warren Buffett in the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Report for 1996. Seriously, costs matter. For example, equity mutual funds incur corporate expenses, largely payments to the fund's managers, that average about a hundred basis points. A hundred basis points equals one percent. A levy likely to cut the returns their investors earn by ten percent or more over time. A low expense ratio is the single most important reason why a fund does well. Therefore, carefully consider the role of expense ratios in shaping fund returns. If you select actively managed funds, emulate the index advantage by choosing low-cost funds. The surest route to top quartile returns is bottom quartile expenses. Rule 2. Consider carefully the added costs of advice. Tens of millions of investors need personal guidance in allocating their assets and selecting funds. Other tens of millions do not. For those in the latter category, some 3,000 no-load funds without sales commissions are available to choose from. And it is the essence of simplicity for self-reliant, intelligent, informed investors to purchase shares without resorting to an intermediary salesperson or financial advisor. Assuming the funds are properly selected, buying no-load funds is the least costly way to own mutual funds, and costs will consume the lowest possible proportion of future returns. For the many investors who require guidance, there are registered advisors and brokerage account executives, many of whom serve their clients ably at a fair price. Good advisors give you their personal attention, help you avoid some of the pitfalls of investing, and provide worthwhile asset allocation and fund selection services. But like any of us, they must earn their keep, providing you with valuable services that make it worth your while to invest through them but I do not believe that they can identify in advance the top-performing managers. No one can. And I'd avoid those who claim they can do so. The best advisors can help you develop a long-range investment strategy and an intelligent plan for its implementation. You should know exactly how much the advisor's services will cost. Advice may be provided by registered fee-only investment advisors, who usually charge annual fees beginning at 1% of assets. It may also be provided by brokerage firm representatives who receive sales commissions. Commissions represent a significant drag on a mutual fund's performance, especially if the fund's shares are held for only a short period. It would be foolish to pay a 6% load if you expect to hold the shares for only a few years. Over ten years, on the other hand, such a load would cut your return by a more modest 0.6% per year. In all, paying a reasonable price for guidance, especially when the advisor helps minimize your all-in cost, his or her cost plus the costs of the funds, by focusing on low-cost funds, may well be acceptable in light of the services you receive. Rule 3. Do not overrate past fund performance. My third rule has to do with the first element that catches the eye of most investors, whether experienced or novice. The fund's past track record. The analogy to a horse race implied by the phrase track record is presumably unintentional. But track records, helpful as they may be in appraising how thoroughbred horses will run, and they may not be very effective there either, are usually hopelessly misleading in appraising how money managers will perform. There is no way under the sun to forecast a fund's future absolute returns based on its past record. Even if someone could accurately forecast the future absolute returns the stock market will deliver, no mean task, there is no way to forecast the future returns that an individual mutual fund will deliver relative to the market. The only exception would be the relative returns of index funds. Now, I must contradict myself ever so slightly. Two highly probable, if not certain, forecasts can be made. One, funds with unusually high expenses are likely to underperform appropriate market indexes. Two, funds with past relative returns that have been substantially superior to the returns of an appropriate market index 
will regress toward and usually below the market mean over time. Reversion to the mean, the law of gravity in the financial markets that causes funds that are up to go down and funds that are down to go up, is clear, quantifiable, and apparently almost inevitable. Rule 4. Use past performance to determine consistency and risk. Despite Rule 3, there is an important role that past performance can play in helping you to make your fund selections. While you should disregard a single aggregate number showing a fund's past long-term return, you can learn a great deal by studying the nature of its past returns. Above all, look for consistency. When I evaluate mutual funds, and I've looked carefully at many hundreds of them during my long career, I like to look at a fund's ranking among other funds with similar policies and objectives, i.e., I compare a large-cap value fund with other large-cap value funds, a small-cap growth fund with other comparable funds, and so on. Risk, however measured and however elusive a concept, except in retrospect, should be given the most careful consideration by the intelligent investor. Markets, no matter what you may have come to think, do not always rise. Rule 5. Beware of stars. Even though their light may shine brightly for a time, many superstars seem to limit their association with a given fund. The average portfolio manager lasts only five years at the helm of a fund, and in one of the largest, most aggressive, and formerly hottest fund organizations, the average stint has been only two and a half years. Turnover in the fund portfolio, which inevitably accompanies a change of managers, results in truly onerous cost penalties. These superstars are more like comets. They brighten the firmament for a moment in time, only to burn out and vanish into the dark universe. Seek good managers if you will, but rely on their professionalism, experience, and steadfastness rather than on their stardom. Be careful, too, about star systems, as distinct from star managers. The best-known stars are, of course, those funds awarded top five-star billing by Morning Star Mutual Funds. I call these funds Morning Stars. The fund world has embraced and has encouraged investors to invest on the basis of a system in which a fund with four or five stars is a success. One or two stars, sometimes even three, mark a failure. But as the editors of Morning Star Mutual Funds candidly acknowledge, their star ratings have little predictive value. The Hulbert Financial Digest has demonstrated that buying five-star funds as they emerge and redeeming them when they lose their top rating produces below-market returns at above-market risk. Not a good combination. I have little doubt that most of today's three-, four-, and five-star funds, if held over time, will outpace their one-star peers. Even as you ignore star portfolio managers, then, be skeptical of funds with the lowest star ratings and focus on funds with the higher star ratings. But don't trade them. Rule 6. Beware of asset size. Funds can get too big for their britches. It is as simple as that. Avoid large fund organizations that, one, have no history of closing their funds, that is, terminating the offering of their shares, to new investors, or, two, seem willing to let their funds grow, irrespective of their investment goals, to seemingly infinite size beyond their power to differentiate their investment results from the crowd. Just what constitutes too big is a complex issue. It relates to fund style, management philosophy, and portfolio strategy. A few examples. A fund investing primarily in large-cap stocks can surely be managed successfully, if not for truly exceptional returns, even at the $20 billion or $30 billion or higher level. None of today's funds of that size has outpaced the Standard & Poor's 500 index over the past five years. For a fund investing aggressively in tiny microcap stocks, usually market capitalizations of less than $250 million, $300 million of assets might be too large. Size, present and potential, is a highly important concern. Excessive size can and probably will kill any possibility of investment excellence. The record is clear that for the overwhelming majority of funds, the best years come when they are small. Small was beautiful, but nothing fails like success. 
when these funds caught the public fancy, or more likely were vigorously hawked to a public that was unaware of its potential exposure to the problems of size, their best years were behind them. As I'll explain in Chapter 12, unbridled asset growth in a fund should be a warning flag to intelligent investors. Rule 7. Don't own too many funds. A single ready-made balanced index fund, holding 65% stocks and 35% bonds, as shown in my earlier example, can meet the needs of many investors. A pair of stock and bond index funds with a tailor-made balance, a higher or lower ratio of stocks, can meet the needs of many more. But what is the optimal number of funds for investors who elect to use actively managed funds? I truly believe that it is generally unnecessary to go much beyond four or five equity funds. Too large a number can easily result in over-diversification. The net result? A portfolio whose performance inevitably comes to resemble that of an index fund. However, because of the higher costs of the non-index fund portfolio, as well as its broadened diversification, its return will almost inevitably fall short. What is more, even though it may be over-diversified, such a portfolio, for example, one with two large-cap blend funds and two small-cap growth funds, may exhibit much more short-term variation around the market return. Therefore, according to the common definition of risk, it will be riskier than the index. Rule 8. Buy your fund portfolio and hold it. When you have identified your long-term objectives, defined your tolerance for risk, and carefully selected an index fund or a small number of actively managed funds that meet your goals, stay the course. Hold tight. Complicating the investment process merely clutters the mind, too often bringing emotion into a financial plan that cries out for rationality. I am absolutely persuaded that investors' emotions, such as greed and fear, exuberance and hope, if translated into rash actions, can be every bit as destructive to investment performance as inferior market returns. To reiterate what the estimable Mr. Buffett said, inactivity strikes us as intelligent behavior. Never forget it. Don't select funds as if they were simply individual common stocks to be discarded and replaced as they face the inevitable ebb and flow of performance. Select a fund with the same thoughtful consideration you would give to appointing a trustee for your assets and establishing a lifetime relationship. That approach is the very essence of simplicity. Decades ago, many of America's wealthiest families chose a single trustee or investment advisor to look after their entire estates and to remain with them ever after. An investment account in a broadly diversified mutual fund is, in truth, neither more nor less than a diversified trust fund except that the mutual fund is usually even more diversified. Suppress the temptation to add redundant layers of diversification. While you're at it, demand that the industry provide you with mutual funds that measure up to a high level of trusteeship responsibility. You deserve it. Simplicity will help you to come down to where you ought to be. Buy right and hold tight. Follow these eight basic rules for investing. In this complex world, stick with simplicity. To the extent you decide that indexing is not for you, these rules should still afford you considerable advantage in the quest for solid long-term returns. My approach to investing is simple in concept, but it is far from easy in implementation. You will find, I fear, a fairly small number of funds that filter through my screens. There ought to be lots more. I would emphasize that each of the eight rules I have offered is designed to help you select a portfolio of funds that may give you the very advantages that have elevated the index fund, the paradigm of simplicity, to its present prominence and acceptance among individual and institutional investors alike. That parallelism is not an accident. So, as you consider your strategy, you cannot afford to ignore the low-cost index fund. Chapter 5 on Indexing, The Triumph of Experience Over Hope The index fund is a most unlikely hero for the typical investor. It is no more nor less than a broadly diversified portfolio, typically run at rock-bottom costs, without the putative benefit of a brilliant, resourceful, and highly skilled portfolio manager. 
The index fund simply buys and holds the securities in a particular index in proportion to their weight in the index. The concept is simplicity writ large. But since the creation of the first index mutual fund in 1975, based on the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index, the concept has emerged triumphant. Because the index fund is the very essence of simplicity, and because it must be considered as the core investment in the fund selection process, the baseline against which all other mutual funds must, finally, be measured, I begin Part 2 of this book with a discussion of its pros and cons. But, confession being good for the soul, I must acknowledge that I have often been described as the apostle of indexing, having started that first index fund nearly a quarter century ago. I am, if possible, a stronger believer in the concept today than I was when I created that fund. After a slow start, the concept has not only steadily gained acceptance by investors, but has come to play a dominant role in the evaluation of traditional, actively managed mutual funds. The index fund, arguably, is now the standard that dominates the debates about investment strategy, asset allocation, and fund selection. If we use the dictionary definition of apostle, a messenger, specifically one who first advocates an important belief or system, I suppose I might qualify as the apostle of the index mutual fund. Ever since 1951, when, in the course of my Princeton University thesis about the mutual fund industry, I expressed doubts about the ability of fund managers to outpace the stock market averages, the vague idea of a market index fund had lingered in my mind. And since the creation of the Vanguard Index Trust in 1975, I have been preaching the gospel of index investing with increasing fervor and conviction. The success that indexing has enjoyed in recent years has been based in part on recognition that acquiring and holding, at extremely low cost, a broadly diversified portfolio dominated by the large, high-grade stocks that dominate the capitalization weight of the market itself, is an intelligent long-term strategy, and a highly productive one as well. That success has also been engendered by the remarkable performance of the Standard & Poor's 500 Index over the past five years, during which its margin of advantage over the average U.S. equity mutual fund has been the highest in history. No matter what the future holds, long-term investors who have chosen an index strategy because of its merits are unlikely to be disappointed. On the other hand, short-term investors who have chosen an index strategy simply because they expect a continuation of the highly superior returns demonstrated by the Standard & Poor's 500 index in the recent past are likely to regret their choice. The historical record makes it clear that the S&P 500 index has encountered intervals of significant shortfall relative to the average mutual fund. The term index fund is all too often used interchangeably with one particular form of index fund, a fund modeled on the Standard & Poor's 500 index. The first index mutual fund was structured in precisely that form, simply because the S&P 500 index was... 1. The standard most widely followed by institutional investors in measuring their relative performance and assessing the results of their portfolio managers. Mutual funds in those days generally didn't provide investors with comparative standards. 2. The more soundly structured of the two best-known indexes. Stocks are weighted by market capitalization rather than, as in the case of the more familiar Dow Jones Industrial Average, the price of one share of stock in each of only 30 companies, and three, representative of 90% of the value of the entire stock market 25 years ago, and now represents about 75% of the value, and thus a solid proxy for the market. When the second index mutual fund appeared a full decade later, it too was S&P 500 based, as was a large majority of all the index funds that followed. But the 75% of the market now represented by the large-cap stocks in the S&P 500 index is not the market. Excluded are stocks with medium and small market capitalizations and typically higher volatility. Nonetheless, the essential theory of indexing is based on owning all of the stocks in the market. 
Theoretically, the preferred standard for the basic index mutual fund would be the Wilshire 5000 equity index of all publicly held stocks in the United States. That index funds are finally achieving grudging acceptance bears witness to the great success that index funds modeled on the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index have enjoyed by providing, in an era of extraordinary absolute stock market returns, superior relative returns as well. In addition, the all-market index fund, modeled on the Wilshire 5000 equity index, is beginning to make competitive inroads as it brings to full fruition the essential theory of indexing that all investors, as a group, cannot possibly outpace the total cost-free return on the entire stock market. But the remaining detractors of index funds still hold to the position that indexing works only in efficient markets, such as those represented by the actively traded, very liquid, large capitalization stocks that overpoweringly dominate the S&P 500 index and comprise 75% of the Wilshire 5000 and not in other presumably less efficient markets. Plausible as that argument may sound, it is specious. The success of indexing is based not necessarily on some notion of market efficiency, but simply on the inability of all investors in any discrete market or market segment to outpace the universe of investments in which they operate. Efficiency relates to a market price structure that generally values all securities properly at any one time, which means that good and bad managers alike will have difficulty in differentiating themselves either way. In inefficient markets, good managers may have greater opportunities to outpace their universe. But the excess returns earned by good managers must inevitably be offset by inferior returns of the exact same dimension by bad managers. However, costs of funds operating in so-called inefficient markets are higher than funds operating in efficient markets. For example, costs of U.S. small-cap funds are systematically higher than those of large-cap funds. In Chapter 6, we shall see that once the relatively higher risks that they assume are accounted for, managed mid-cap and small-cap funds have realized similar, if slightly larger, shortfalls to the indexes in their market sectors, compared to those their large-cap cousins have realized. Costs of international funds are higher still, not only because of their higher expense ratios, but because of much higher custodial costs, taxes, commissions, and market impact costs. As a result, not only do the exact same principles of indexing apply in international markets, but an even larger margin of index superiority is reflected in passively managed international index funds, as compared to actively managed international funds, as will be shown in Chapter 8. Indexing works, as it must, with high effectiveness in all the far-flung corners of the world of equity investing. Indexing works in the bond market, too. Indeed, it is arguably even more valuable where high-grade fixed-income investments are concerned. Bond returns are typically lower than stock returns, so costs take a large toll on the gross annual returns earned by bond funds. The gross returns of competing bond funds tend to be similar, but the costs of most bond funds, as I shall note in Chapter 7, are excessive, giving low-cost bond index funds a remarkable head start. Finally, successful managers who achieve substantial superiority in pre-cost returns are conspicuous by their paucity. There are, apparently, few Peter Lynch's in the bond fund field. There are good managers and bad managers, as always, but no heroes who tower above all others. An understanding of the fact that index funds have proven themselves by outpacing actively managed funds during the past near-quarter century is now pervasive. Experience has triumphed over hope, not only in the academic community, where an apostle of active management is rarely found, but also in the financial media, where the conversion, if not complete, is pervasive. And not only in the world of successful professional investors, recall the comments of Warren Buffett cited earlier in this book, but in the mutual fund industry itself. Nearly all of the major no-load fund complexes have now begun to offer index funds. And not only index funds modeled on the Standard & Poor's 500 stock price index. 
even the major stock brokerage firms are offering index funds on a no-load basis, as is virtually essential. However, they make their index funds available only in investment management accounts, which entail, to whatever avail, an advisory fee that is charged directly to the client. I fear that this trend is less the result of enlightenment than of self-interest. Non-believers have been dragged, kicking and screaming, into the fray to meet a public demand that is now palpable. The need for traditional fund managers to fill out their product lines has outweighed their resistance to accepting the markedly lower fees that index funds must carry. To state what must by now be obvious, the index fund is here to stay. What began as a controversial idea bereft of public demand in 1975 has come to represent the standard of investment return, but the apparently unreachable star for the mutual fund industry. At long last, we are witnessing the triumph of experience over hope. Actual experience has reflected the triumph of passively managed index funds over actively managed funds. Common sense has carried the day. In time, index funds will change the very fabric and nature of the mutual fund industry. Chapter 6 On Equity Styles Tic-tac-toe In recent years, style purity has become the catchphrase of portfolio managers, investment advisors, and mutual fund investors. Mutual funds, sometimes enthusiastically, sometimes reluctantly, are defining their investment strategies and investment policies more clearly. The managers of individual stock funds today feel pressured to keep the portfolios they manage fully invested at all times and to confine themselves to a given portfolio style that defines the fund's strategy. Growth stocks versus value stocks, for example, or large-cap stocks versus small-cap stocks. A powerful argument can be made that the choice of equity fund styles, like the choice of fund portfolio managers, is just one more example of industry witchcraft. Just as absolutely no brute evidence exists that past fund returns are the precursors of future returns, so there is little, if any, evidence that there are superior investment styles that prevail over time. In both cases, above-average returns and below-average returns revert to normal levels. Individual fund returns revert to appropriate market index norms, and equity styles revert to total stock market norms. In both cases, I am speaking of fund returns before the deduction of costs. Why bother with styles at all? This is not a trivial question. There are powerful reasons for owning the entire stock market, or even large capitalization blended, growth and value, funds, the particular fund style that most strongly tends to track, again, before costs are deducted, the total return of the market. But if there is little, if any, evidence of persistence in the investment performance of an individual mutual fund relative to its peers, there is substantial evidence of persistence in the relative risks assumed by individual funds, largely because of the investment style they follow. Style, it turns out, does make a difference. And since style differences are persistent, sheer logic leads us to the conclusion that there is greater probability of persistence in risk-adjusted returns than in total returns earned by each fund. Selecting a particular fund style can enable investors to have an important degree of risk control. Large-cap value funds, for example, have assumed about 50% less volatility than the average fund, and small-cap growth funds have assumed about 50% more. Most investors, properly in my view, will emphasize a strategy that focuses on funds in the large-cap category, especially blended growth and value funds, as a conservative centrist approach to equity investing. Some investors may want to consider two other options, stock-picking funds without a clear mandate but with a broad opportunity to rotate from one market sector to another, or funds that hew to the benchmarks of specific style categories. Investors who rely on style-specific funds can then reflect personal risk preferences or balance out the risks in an existing portfolio that is overweighted or underweighted relative to the market in one style or another. This latter case may be described as a risk-control strategy. Hovering over the entire strategy issue is another major investment decision, whether, regardless of the investment style chosen, 
it should be implemented with a traditionally managed fund or with an index fund that emulates its style. As Peter Bernstein tells the story in his marvelous book, Against the Gods, Blaise Pascal, the father of probability theory, cast the question of the existence of God as a game of chance. A coin is tossed. Which way would you bet? On heads, God is, or tails, God is not. Paraphrasing Pascal, consider the chances of being on the losing side of the bet. If you bet God is, you will live a holy life and give up a few enjoyable temptations, but that's all you lose. If you bet God is not, and you are wrong, but you give in to all temptations, your evil life will cause you to be forever damned. Consequences must outweigh probabilities. Turning to the stock market, Bernstein continues, if you believe it is efficient, and you are right, the best strategy is to buy an index fund. If you believe it is efficient, and you are wrong, you will earn the market's return, but a few actively managed funds will beat you. But if you bet that the market is not efficient, and you are wrong, the consequences of underperforming with an actively managed fund could be very painful. The risk, in short, is much greater if you bet on inefficiency rather than on efficiency. And that is ultimately the conclusion of equity-style analysis in the mutual fund industry. No matter what fund style you seek, you should emphasize low-cost funds and eschew high-cost funds. And for the best bet of all, you should consider indexing in whichever style category you want to include. Index funds boast the additional benefit of absolute fidelity to their investment style. Although there is no guarantee that, say, a small-cap growth manager will limit his investment selections to small-cap growth stocks, it's a certainty that a small-cap growth index fund will invest only in small-cap growth stocks. Rather than emphasizing particular styles, however, a simpler course would be for you to index your entire equity portfolio with the Standard & Poor's 500 Stock Index. A more conservative and more certain wager would be to index your portfolio to the total stock market. If, because of high costs, investing with mutual fund managers is a relative loser's game, although almost surely a winner's game in absolute terms over the long run, is it not similar to another game, one between battling global armies? I answer the question by way of analogy, using an example from the 1983 movie War Games. We are in the war room, where our generals are trying to ward off an incipient global nuclear war precipitated by a young computer nerd who has cracked the U.S. security system. The boy says he can solve the problem he has created, and with all other hope lost, the generals agree to let him try. He programs the U.S. air defense computer with a game of tic-tac-toe. Calculating at a furious pace, the computer realizes that neither opponent can win the game, or the nuclear war, and the screen goes blank. The action ceases. Peace reigns. Then these words appear on the computer screen. A strange game. The only winning move is not to play. How about a nice game of chess? It is entirely appropriate to consider that mutual fund managers, with all their intelligence, training, and ability— and with all of the computer power at their command, are engaged in a vast competition with one another to draw the best stocks and discard the worst, all with a view toward winning the performance game and attracting the most dollars to manage. And all the while, consider that funds that do not play the game at all, the index funds, may be accumulating the most capital for their investors. So it is fair to ask. Have investment management games like global warfare games become losers' games, just like tic-tac-toe? The compelling evidence presented in this chapter suggests that the answer is yes. Chapter 7. On Bonds. Treadmill to Oblivion. Bond mutual funds can fill a useful role. They make it possible for investors to gain the extraordinary value of broad diversification over as many as 100 bonds or more, reducing risk without an attendant sacrifice in gross return. Bond funds are professionally managed, and most emphasize high-quality investment-grade bonds in their portfolios. 
Many offer a particular range of maturities, from short, one to three years, to long, ten to twenty years or more, with gradations in between, enabling investors to balance their income requirements with their tolerance for risk. Bond funds provide considerable flexibility to investors by facilitating purchases and liquidations of shares in small amounts. Some bond funds offer these important advantages at reasonable cost. Most, however, do not. Partly as a result, the once-flourishing bond fund segment of the mutual fund industry has lost much of its attraction for investors. The rise and decline of the bond fund empire is one of the most captivating yet untold chapters in the annals of the mutual fund industry. That story reminds us that the mutual fund principles of diversification and management, as valid today as they have ever been, cannot provide acceptable returns to investors when they are offset by excessive cost encumbrances. It also provides a picture of the complacency and overreaching characteristic of many managers of fixed-income funds. Surprising as it may seem, as recently as 1993, bond funds, then with assets of $760 billion compared to $749 billion in stock funds and $565.3 billion in money market funds, were the largest component of the mutual fund industry. In fact, they reached their peak relative importance seven years earlier, in 1986, when bond fund assets of $260 billion were 60% larger than the $160 billion invested in equity funds. I am not quite alone in my concern about today's bond funds as a group. My apprehension is shared by no less an investment professional than Peter Lynch best known as the brilliant equity investor who served as portfolio manager of Magellan Fund during the 1970s and 80s. He publicly shared, in a 1993 interview with Barron's, my positive conviction about the merits of stock index funds, and he has also echoed my misgivings about bond funds. Their purpose in life eludes me, he says, adding, Bond funds have been consistently outperformed by individual bonds, sometimes by as much as 2% a year, doing worse the longer the funds were held. The benefits of expert management were exceeded by the expenses that were extracted from the funds to support the experts. In his opinion, since one U.S. Treasury bond or Ginnie Mae certificate is the same as the next, there is little a manager of one of these funds can do to distinguish himself from competitors. But the Magellan Fund manager, I think, overstates the case. Bond funds do serve a purpose. Unlike bonds themselves, they usually maintain relatively fixed maturities, enabling an investor to choose a suitable maturity, long, intermediate, or short-term, and have it remain relatively constant over time. And there are some competent professional bond fund managers that stand out, although, sadly, only a very small fraction among them make their services available at costs that justify the portfolio management skills they offer. Nonetheless, Peter Lynch revealed a simple investment truism. In highly efficient market segments comprising commodity-like securities, it is extremely difficult for even the most brilliant money managers to garner a significant margin of advantage before the deduction of costs. It follows, then, that it is virtually impossible for them to avoid providing returns to the shareholders of the funds they manage, after the deduction of fund costs, that match market returns. When costs are excessive, the shortfall in return is excessive, too. Bond fund investors should no longer suffer excessive costs. They deserve substantial reductions in fees and loads from the vast majority of funds that are charging fees that become more confiscatory with the passage of time. The treadmill leads to ever more inadequate bond fund returns and finally approaches oblivion for the incremental return on the investor's capital. Continued failure to provide adequate returns will surely lead to the fall of the near $1 trillion bond fund empire itself a treadmill to oblivion that would represent some form of poetic justice. But I would rather see a treadmill that leads to the oblivion of exorbitant sales charges and excessive management fees. 
If that happens, the valuable investment characteristics of bond funds could emerge, and the bond funds segment of the mutual fund industry could be restored to the favor it deserves in the marketplace. I hope that regulatory and self-governance mechanisms will finally work. But failing that outcome, it is up to investors to eschew high-cost bond funds when they make their selections, to desert high-cost bonds if they own any, and to seek out well-managed bond funds operating at low cost, and bond index funds that track high-quality bond market indexes. Finally, the future of the bond fund industry is up to bond fund investors. Chapter 8 On Global Investing Acres of Diamonds Acres of Diamonds is the title of a classic lecture by Dr. Russell Conwell, founder of Temple University. He delivered his talk the world over during the 1870s and 1880s, long before this era of mass communication, and his words inspired millions of people. Dr. Conwell told the story of an ancient Persian named Al-Hafed, a wealthy man who sought even greater riches. One night he dreamed of finding a great diamond mine. Soon after, he set off on a search for it that would take him to every corner of the ancient world. The quest forced Al-Hafed to spend all his wealth. Despondent, he cast himself into the sea at the Pillars of Hercules, sinking beneath the foaming crest of the tide. Later, on Al-Hafed's very property in Persia, so Dr. Conwell's story goes, his successor led his camel to the Garden Brook and noticed a curious flash in the shallow stream and pulled out a black stone with an eye of light, reflecting all the colors of the rainbow. He had discovered in Al-Hafed's garden the Golconda Diamond Mine, which was to yield some of the world's greatest diamonds, including the Kohinoor Diamond that is treasured among England's crown jewels. The moral of the story is clear and simple. Stay home and dig in your own garden instead of tempting fate in an alien world. You'll find acres of diamonds right where you are. The more I read about investing outside the United States, the more I think about this story. I am not suggesting that the U.S. economy is a new Golconda, nor that investing in overseas ventures is parallel to death in a foreign land. But here in America we have, at least at the moment, the most productive economy, the greatest innovation, the most hospitable legal environment, and the finest capital markets on the globe. With 5% of the world's population, we produce 25% of its goods and services. It is safe to say that America is the envy of almost every other nation. As U.S. citizens, we should count our blessings every day. If our diamond load is within our own borders, shouldn't the investments we choose for our portfolios stay here too? I believe that would be a sensible strategy. Overseas investments, holdings in the corporations of other nations, are not essential nor even necessary to a well-diversified portfolio. For investors who disagree, and there are some valid reasons for global investing, I would recommend limiting international investments to a maximum of 20% of a global equity portfolio. I have serious reservations about a full market-weighted global strategy. It involves a very heavy layer of one particular risk that an equity investor never need assume. Currency risk. Returns earned from investing in stock valued in one's home currency are measured in the coin of the realm in which the investor earns, spends, and saves. Sometimes to your advantage as a citizen, to be sure, sometimes not. Even if foreign investments were to provide the same rate of return, measured in their local currencies, as U.S. investments, the returns earned might be very different depending on the strength or weakness of the dollar in world markets. A strong dollar reduces the returns earned by U.S. investors in foreign markets. A weak dollar increases the returns earned in foreign markets. I believe that the performance of foreign stocks for U.S. investors in the long run will be determined by each nation's fundamental returns, based on dividend yields and earnings growth, rather than by currency returns. Taking into account the national economic growth rates around the globe during the 1990s, and comparing them to the powerful global reach, entrepreneurial energy, and technology leadership we see in our nation today, 
it would be logical to expect U.S. growth to exceed the growth in other nations. On the other hand, the United States may well be at the pinnacle of its economic cycle, while many of the European powers, Japan, and the emerging markets, beset respectively with high unemployment, overextended financial institutions, and deep recessions, may have reached some sort of nadir. Further complicating the matter, it is never clear whether these economic factors are accurately reflected in present market valuations. The race for superior market returns around the globe is never an easy one to call. But there was what seemed to me an easy call in 1994. As it turned out, that call has proven correct so far. Such weakness in the dollar could not continue indefinitely. Given that likelihood, past performance data so heavily influenced by the weakness in the dollar were deeply flawed. Looking to the future without being aware that the weak dollar had added 7.7 .7 percentage points annually to foreign stock returns would result in highly exaggerated expectations. In fact, from the close of 1994 through mid-1998, the dollar's strength was restored and actually reduced foreign returns by an annualized rate of 4.6 percentage points. A current example of the risk involved in global investing is Southeast Asia. Through mid-1997, many global investors had looked to these emerging markets as offering an unusually favorable opportunity for earning superior long-term returns. And, during the 1980s and 1990s, both the economies and the markets of Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and the Philippines had indeed distinguished themselves. In the newly global economy, their populations and economies were growing apace and soaring stock returns doubled their weight in world markets, from 1.9% in 1991 to 3.8% as 1997 began. But by autumn of 1997, their government-dominated financial systems weakened, their currencies plummeted, and their economies slumped. Rare was the Southeast Asian market that did not tumble by 40% or more in local currency terms and another 40% in dollar terms. Declines of 80% or more in value were the norm for U.S. investors, all in the span of just a few months. With other world markets marching upward, the relative weight of the Southeast Asian markets tumbled by an astonishing 70%. As 1998 began, their weight was 1.2% of world markets, or less than one-third of their weight only a year earlier, when they reached the pinnacle of their popularity with fund investors. The problems persisted in 1998, and these emerging markets continued to deteriorate. These reversals have given investors a humbling lesson in the risks of global investing. Those risks are especially high in nations where U.S. standards for accounting financial transparency and liquidity have not yet been attained. In this day and age, it would hardly pay to ignore the impact on every nation on earth of the globalization of economies and financial markets. Our nation is no exception to this trend. Indeed, it is arguable that the United States has been the leading force in creating and sustaining globalization. But it seems to me that for American investors interested in capitalizing on the global trend, the solution lies within our own borders. Seeking to earn higher returns by holding global portfolios has been our version of al Hafed's fruitless search in acres of diamonds. Large additional exposure to foreign stocks to investment in foreign nations is not essential. In terms of risk and return, the record of the past, whether prologue to the future or not, does not provide compelling reasons to abandon the acres of diamonds that can be unearthed at home in order to seek unknown diamond loads abroad. Dr. Conwell's theme was, do what you can with what you have where you are today. He focused on opportunities in Philadelphia, but he also recounted examples of finding great wealth all over America, from Pennsylvania to New England to North Carolina and California. He used John D. Rockefeller and oil as one example, and Colonel John Sutter and gold as another. Dr. Conwell was always careful to dignify the search for wealth with a higher purpose. I say you ought to be rich, he would intone. You have no right to be poor. There are so many opportunities right here. But, he would quickly add, we all know that there are things more valuable than money, 
some things grander and more sublime. The thrill of earning money to build one's own home and the nobility of helping those in need, he noted, were among those things greatly enhanced by the use of money. If he lived in today's world, Dr. Conwell would doubtless talk about the accumulation of financial wealth for a comfortable life and a peaceful retirement. I have no way of knowing whether he would also advocate investing in corporations whose home is in America. But with the legend of al Hafed in mind, it is easy to imagine that he would stake his claim on a portfolio that was fully invested in U.S. equities. However precarious the perch, America is sitting on top of the world as the 1990s end. If our pride in that achievement is false, a mighty fall may be coming. It happened in Japan a decade ago, and it can happen here. Such a fall from grace by the United States, however unlikely, is not impossible. Investors must consider for themselves the relative returns and risks around the globe and then allocate their portfolios accordingly. But for me, if some Latter-day Conwell were to quote Roger Lowenstein's wise advice in the Wall Street Journal, I'd agree. You can lead a happy investment life without leaving home. Chapter 9 On Selecting Superior Funds The Search for the Holy Grail Knowledgeable observers realize that the central task of investing is to gain the highest possible portion of the long-run return achieved by the class of financial assets in which they invest. But they recognize and accept that the portion will be less than 100%. As I have indicated in Chapter 4, a market index fund can provide 99% of the annual returns earned by its stock market benchmark while the average actively managed stock fund can be expected to provide about 85%. While the future relative returns of managed funds are uncertain, it is difficult to imagine that they will rise to anywhere near 99%. Low-cost index funds, on the other hand, are almost certain to reach the 98-99% to level consistently over time. As I noted earlier, even industry leaders are coming to recognize these realities, explicitly acknowledging, at least in one case, that the average fund can never outperform the market. In fact, even those whose business is the promotion of actively managed funds cannot ignore these two poignant realities of the marketplace. One, investors as a group do not, cannot, and will not beat the market. And two, the overwhelming odds are against any particular mutual funds doing so consistently over an investment lifetime. The real world of investing is not at all like Garrison Keillor's mythical Lake Wobegon, where all of the children are above average. Recognizing these powerful odds against any individual funds outpacing an unmanaged index, the mutual fund industry has implicitly conceded this point. Reflecting the concession, much of the industry is engaged in a hell-bent mission to take hold of the finest instrument ever created for long-term investing and transform it into a vehicle for intermediate-term and even short-term speculation. Intelligent investors must accept the fact that over time the fund or funds they select, irrespective of past performance, will inevitably revert toward the mean. But the mean here is defined as the market mean reduced by the costs the fund incurs, advisory fees, operating expenses, and marketing costs, in all the expense ratio, plus the cost of buying and selling portfolio securities, transaction costs. In the world of mutual funds, as we've seen, these costs are extremely high. The annual expense ratio of a median equity fund is now 1.5% and rising. Transaction costs are difficult to quantify with precision, but with the high portfolio turnover rates generated in mutual funds, an estimate of 0.5 to 1% annually hardly seems excessive. Current all-in costs, then, can be conservatively estimated at upward of 2% per year. Given these realities, the search for the holy grail of market-beating long-term returns has been every bit as frustrating to fund managers and fund investors in the 20th century, and will surely be so in the 21st century, as the search for the Holy Grail of the Last Supper was to the legendary Knights of King Arthur's Round Table in the 6th century. 
What have the academics found? We'll start with the guru of the academic profession in the mutual fund arena, Professor William F. Sharp of Stanford University. He carefully examined the ten-year records of the 100 largest equity funds, measured each year, accounting for more than 40% of the assets of all such funds. He then compared their returns with the returns of comparably weighted market sector indexes, including a U.S. Treasury bill component, thereby accounting for the persistent performance lag created by fund cash positions. Dr. Sharp properly acknowledged that the cost advantage ascribable to large funds probably provided superior relative returns for his sample of funds, but found nonetheless that the average return of the funds he studied fell short of the multi-index return by 0.64% per year over the past decade. It should go without saying that using the 100 largest funds in itself creates a substantial bias in favor of successful funds. The shortfall could not be deemed significantly different from zero, but the data surely undermined any belief that a typical actively managed equity fund can outperform a passive alternative. The data would have been even less favorable to the funds if Sharp had included sales charges. Dr. Sharp then singled out those fund managers who seemed to have demonstrated skill in selecting stocks over various interim periods and examined whether the success continued in future periods. He investigated common measures for judging funds, size, past performance, and the Sharp ratio of risk-adjusted return. The best evidence of some level of performance consistency appeared in the results for the previous 12 months. That is, selecting a fund on the basis of its year earlier performance slightly improved the chance of seeing that performance continue. An investor who held the top 25 funds, the top quartile in Sharp's study, shifting funds as needed on that basis year after year, would have added an annual return of 0.8% relative to the index return over the subsequent five- and ten-year periods. An investor who had holdings in the bottom quartile would have underperformed by 0.5% per year over the five-year period and 1.3% annually over the ten-year period. Even disregarding the extra taxes incurred by switching funds regularly, this rate of return would seem a rather shaky basis for an investment strategy. Do winners repeat? Sharp summarized his results this way. If the past ten years are indicative of the next ten, one might answer in the affirmative, although I would note the positive margin is modest to a fault. However, perhaps Sharp's neutral position, not proven, is more appropriate, for he conceded that the evidence is far from conclusive, statistically or economically. Despite the serious lag of mutual fund returns during the great bull market, one out of every six managed equity funds succeeded in outpacing the market's return. Of the 258 general equity funds that survived that period, the industry was far smaller in 1982, 42 succeeded in outpacing the 18.9% return of the Wilshire 5000 Equity Index a lower hurdle, to be sure, than the 19.8% return of the S&P 500 index. But only 12 of those 42, one of every 21 survivors, did so by a margin of 1.5 percentage points. If we assume that the fund's annual tracking error relative to the index was a fairly modest 3%, then only a return of 1.5% in excess of the index return would represent statistically significant outperformance. Based on their actual tracking errors, only three of the twelve funds, only about one in each one hundred, cleared the hurdle of statistical significance. Nonetheless, it's instructive to examine all twelve funds. A bit of microanalysis shows that these twelve funds were a rather motley group. Six carved out their entire long-term margins in the early years when their assets were small and have been mediocre performers for years. That leaves six legitimate top performers. Interestingly, and importantly, all six had the same portfolio managers throughout all or most of the period. The manager's average age is now 57. Two closed to new cash flow before their assets reached $1 billion. The twelve winners could not have been easy to identify in advance. At the outset, their shares were owned by relatively few fund investors. 
Their aggregate 1982 assets totaled $1.8 billion, only 3% of total equity fund assets. In any event, despite their acknowledged past success, no one can be sure of the extent to which it may recur in the future, whether or not their managers stay on the job or retire and rest on their laurels. Today, could investors be highly confident of superior returns if they selected one of the four legitimate fund champions that remain open to investors? It would seem, at best, a counterintuitive decision for an intelligent investor. Now, let's examine the public records of advisors who recommend mutual funds. For the past five years, the New York Times has published, each quarter, the records of equity fund portfolios selected and supervised by five respected advisors who began their task on July 7, 1993. During this period, not one of the portfolios has come close to matching the record of the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, which was chosen by the Times as the appropriate comparative standard. The advisor's average annual return of 11.8% provided 59% of the annual return of the market, and the index fund provided 99%. While some of these advisors chose equity portfolios that were designed to be somewhat less risky, that is, less volatile, than the 500 index itself, the decline in the index during the third quarter of 1998 proved to be but 85% of the decline in the average fund portfolio of the advisors. In any event, providing only 59% of the market's annual return during a five-year period in which even the average fund provided 70% represents a failure that verges on the astounding. To make matters even worse, when it comes to the capital accumulated during the full period, the average portfolio of the advisors provided just 49% of the final growth of the S&P 500 index, while the index fund provided 99%. Selecting winning funds, even by experts, is hardly bereft of challenges. Whether we consider academic studies, many of which I presume included tests of predicting future returns that were found wanting and were never published, or the pragmatic and unforgiving actual results of the funds with the best long-term records, or the picks of fund advisory services, or records of funds of funds, the odds of selecting mutual funds that are top performers in the future have proved extremely poor. The chances that individual fund investors will find the holy grail that will identify in advance the future's superior performers seem equally dismal. Before this era of performance evaluation on a relative basis and sophisticated return attribution on a factor basis, Equity mutual funds with active managers who achieved the best sustained long-term records represented the pinnacle of performance excellence. In recent years, the acceptance of such funds as representing the Holy Grail has been endangered by the clear performance superiority of the index fund and by its rapidly increasing acceptance. As a result, much of the industry has, at least implicitly, mounted a counterattack. If only a rare fund can hope to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the market on a long-term basis, aggressive fund distributors seem to argue, let's gain an edge by encouraging investors to abandon the conventional buy-and-hold fund strategy and switch opportunistically among funds. To be sure, the thesis leaves aside the self-evident fact that, although some investors may, against all odds, succeed in outpacing the market by astute selection of funds, investors as a group must underperform the market by the amount of their costs. This brute fact remains firmly in place. In short, the traditional investor strategy of holding managed mutual funds for the long term has not provided the holy grail of market superior returns, not by a long shot. Nor will the current fad of switching rapidly into and out of funds. The index strategy, by definition, must provide less than market returns, but only by a slight margin. And that is the true holy grail, achieving through a diversified investment portfolio a return that is as close to 100% of the market return as is possible. The odds remain high that few equity mutual fund portfolio managers will beat the stock market, and that, over the long pull, even those who win will not do so by a very wide margin. 
After all, fund managers are mere mortals who operate in highly efficient markets. The bogus fund-switching strategy in vogue today, implicitly designed to counter the index strategy by misleading investors into thinking that individually they can somehow outfox the market, is certain, I choose that word carefully, to be a loser's game. And the argument that a fund of funds can somehow emulate the result of a long-term buy-and-hold index fund strategy by adding a fee averaging 1.7% per year on top of the 2% cost incurred by the average fund flies in the face of reason. Abundant and compelling past evidence reinforces the validity of this elemental conclusion. For fund managers, the most effective response to the challenge of the index fund is not a chimera, ever to chase the market return but never capture it, but common sense. Fund managers must reduce fees to equitable levels, return to the traditional fund philosophy of long-term investing, and limit the asset levels of the portfolios they manage to a size appropriate to their strategies and objectives. These changes should make the returns of actively managed funds more competitive than those of passive index funds. Taken together, each of these small steps toward manager competitiveness would constitute one giant forward step for the mutual fund shareholders. The golden rule, put the investor first, is the best route to the holy grail we should all be seeking. If this industry fails to implement this golden rule, low-cost index funds will continue to provide the last best chance for investors to find the holy grail of optimal investment returns. Chapter 10 On Reversion to the Mean Sir Isaac Newton's Revenge on Wall Street At first blush, the principle of reversion to the mean might seem a slightly dry and uninspiring subject. I assure you it is anything but that. This principle from the theoretical world of academe has proven to be wholly pragmatic in the very real world of the financial markets. It is evident in the relative returns of equity mutual funds, in the relative returns of a whole range of stock market sectors, and, over the long term, in the absolute returns earned by common stocks as a group. Reversion to the mean, or RTM, represents the operation of a kind of law of gravity in the stock market, through which returns mysteriously seem to be drawn to norms of one kind or another over time. This application of the universal law of gravity might even be characterized as Sir Isaac Newton's revenge on Wall Street. As investors, many of us have chosen mutual funds as all or part of our investment programs. Whether funds are a part of your portfolio or not, you have probably carefully considered your own financial circumstances and risk tolerances and decided on your optimal allocation of assets between fixed-income investments and stocks. And if you share in the powerful and rarely challenged ethic of our era, that common stocks are virtually certain to provide the highest returns of any major asset class over the long term, a substantial portion of your program may well be invested in equity funds. Assuming that is the case, how should intelligent investors who select mutual funds undertake the task of choosing them? Let me start with my own assessment of how not to go about it basing selections principally, or even importantly, on the records of exceptional past performance that are published and promoted by the hyperbolic marketing machine that drives the mutual fund industry today. You will be well served if you ignore those claims. The overpowering lesson of history, as I have been trying to persuade you in earlier chapters, is, in the long run, a well-diversified equity portfolio is a commodity, providing rates of return that are highly likely to resemble closely and finally fall short of those of the stock market as a whole. By the end of the period over which you may accumulate your nest egg, be it ten years or fifty years, the odds are that a fund's gross rate of annual return will approximate that of the stock market. I choose the word gross with care. Given the excessive costs borne by most mutual funds, including the fully disclosed, if often ignored, direct expenses used for operating, marketing, and investment advisory costs and for generous profits for managers, plus the hidden costs of fund portfolio transactions, the net rate of return of the funds as a group 
and over the long run of individual funds, has tended to lag the market by from one and a half to two and a half percentage points annually. These differences in annual returns, if extended over long periods of time, will make a dramatic difference in your final capital. In periods as short as one year, many mutual funds, especially small aggressive ones, can and do defy the odds. In some decade-long periods, perhaps one out of five funds succeeds in doing so by a material amount. But in the very long run, there is a profound tendency for the returns of high-performing funds to come down to earth, and almost as inevitably for the returns of low-performing funds to come up to earth, as it were. In fact, bottom-performing funds tend to remain there because of high expenses. Since these expenses persist, upward moves of these funds are impeded. Indeed, the distance traveled in the course of these descents and descents tends to be directly proportional to the earlier distance above or below the market's return. Reversion toward the market mean is the dominant factor in long-term mutual fund returns. Mutual fund marketers assume, usually correctly, that most investors are completely unaware that today's top performers are overwhelmingly likely both to be tomorrow's ordinary participants in the stock market and to parallel the average of their peers. In other words, today's Beau Brummels are tomorrow's Joe Sixpacks. Indeed, despite compelling evidence of that outcome, fund advertisers consistently hawk top performers. Fund organizations know full well that today's idols have feet of clay. But as long as there are believers in witchcraft, the purveyors of witches' brew will create and peddle elixirs and panaceas, engendering costly and counterproductive investment choices that inevitably come to grips with yesterday's realities, not tomorrow's. No study exists that suggests the opposite conclusion, that the very few long-term winners that have emerged, usually through highly superior returns in their early years when they have very small assets and few shareholders, can be selected in advance. In the shorter run, the irrationality in stock returns is created by the speculative element. Stock market irrationality can be measured by the ephemeral but critical factor represented by the stock market's price-earnings ratio. If, following Lord Keynes, we use the term investment to describe the fundamental return based on earnings and dividends, we use the term speculation to describe this second determinant of stock prices, the price that investors will pay for each dollar of corporate earnings. If the power of fundamentals dominates market returns in the very long run, the power of speculation dominates market returns in the shorter run. Speculation is, ultimately, temporary and fickle. Over time, investors have been willing to pay an average of about $14 for each one dollar of earnings. But if in their optimism they are willing to pay twenty-one dollars, stock prices will leap by fifty percent for that reason alone. If in their pessimism they are willing to pay only seven dollars, stock prices will fall by fifty percent. The changing price of one dollar of earnings creates powerful leverage indeed, but it doesn't last forever, nor even for an investing lifetime. Even over periods as long as a quarter century, however, there have been variations in returns based on the esoteric force of speculation rather than on the rock foundation of investment. But they have been reasonably subdued. The combination of dividend yields and earnings growth has remained the predominant driver of return. The academic aspects of RTM, what the historical statistics tell us, suggest that mean reversion is alive and well. It has been manifested in almost every aspect of investing, in shaping relative returns for individual mutual funds, in shaping the relative performance of diverse stock market sectors, and in determining the absolute levels of long-term stock returns, albeit perhaps at a prospective level that may be somewhat higher than in the past. If, as an academic matter, you accept this thesis, what actions does it imply for the wholly pragmatic business of investing? How can this history help to ensure that you and your family will have an optimal opportunity to accumulate capital? As we saw in Chapter 3, much comfort can be found in an appropriate asset allocation mix. 
Today's financial markets seem to carry a higher-than-normal risk component, but I do not believe that investors should abandon equities. In a retirement plan, for example, I would suggest balancing the potential risks and returns by centering on a 70% equity, 30% bond program. I'd shade equities higher, up to 90-10, for those at the beginning of their accumulation programs, provided that they have a healthy appetite for returns, a strong stomach for risks, and an extended time, 15 to 40 years, before retirement. For anyone who is making regular investments that are modest relative to the capital already salted away and who has more conservative instincts and a shorter time horizon, 1 to 15 years, I'd shade equities lower, perhaps all the way down to 35-65. No one knows what future returns the financial markets will provide. A balanced approach has been validated over centuries, not because it provided the highest returns, it clearly didn't, but because it achieved solid long-term returns without excessive short-term risks, hardly an unacceptable outcome. With the stage thus set, however roughly, for future market returns, what does RTM suggest about equity investment strategy? Since RTM prevails among all market sectors, such as growth stocks and value stocks, large-cap stocks and small-cap stocks, and U.S. stocks and international stocks, most investors should own equity funds that represent a broad cross-section of the U.S. stock market, in which large-cap stocks are the predominant component. Investors who believe they can garner a performance edge by selecting or even overweighting funds with different investment styles and strategies should be aware of the risks involved in doing so. For those who believe that the clear lessons of history are pointing us in the wrong direction, always a risky bet, an equally risky bet remains, determining which of these countervailing segments will in fact prove to be superior in the years to come. If, for example, large-cap and small-cap stocks do not revert to the market mean over the next 10 to 20 years, an investor has to guess which of the two is more likely to provide superior returns. It is for this reason that I prefer, on both theoretical and practical grounds, index funds, that track the total U.S. stock market. With their extraordinarily broad diversification over a wide-ranging spectrum of large, mid- and small-cap stocks alike, these funds are the ultimate response to the power of RTM in the stock market. A decision to own an all-stock market index fund also solves the problem of fund selection. Why fly in the face of historical evidence by trying to select individual mutual funds in the hope of picking a big winner? Given the power of mean reversion in the returns of individual mutual funds, an index fund provides the most reliable participation in the future returns of equities as a group. Surely it has proved its worth in the past. Notwithstanding my preference for the total market fund, a Standard & Poor's 500 index fund is by no means an unacceptable choice. This large-cap index fund carries a 75% weight in the U.S. stock market and cannot diverge widely from the total market even in short-term periods. RTM suggests that its long-run returns will closely parallel those of the total market. Given low costs, either index fund should provide investors with the best possible opportunity to earn returns approaching 100% of the market return. In this modern era of investing, the descriptive phrase, the crown jewels, the family's most valuable asset, has taken on new meaning. Investors aspire to something far more important than diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. They aspire to accumulate sufficient capital to reach their personal financial goals. A comfortable and independent retirement is a major goal for most investors. When the time for retirement comes to the breadwinner, the family's most valuable asset, its crown jewel, will almost certainly be the capital value of the retirement plan. Tax-deferred plans are especially valuable jewels because tax deferral, combined with low-cost investing, is the most valuable weapon in the long-term investor's arsenal. Limited only by the provisions of the Internal Revenue Code, you should put every penny you can spare into your IRA or your 401k or 403b thrift plan. An investment program that carries the theoretical armor of RTM, 
the mathematical armor of regular investing and the protective armor of a balanced strategy, combined with the powerful weaponry of compound interest, deferred taxes, and low cost, would be applauded by Sir Isaac Newton. Even as the proverbial apple drops to the ground, so too do high-performing mutual funds and surging sectors of the stock market. The returns achieved in the most productive eras of the stock market itself, given enough time, have dropped to normal levels. Newton's law of gravity, applied to the manifold mean reversion of returns in the financial markets, should also help you to think through and develop an intelligent financial plan, and to implement it with simplicity and common sense, the better to accumulate a retirement fund of generous proportions. Powerful evidence of reversion to the mean in the financial markets is found not only in academic studies, but in pragmatic experience. As you accumulate capital, be sure to use the concept to your benefit. Chapter 11 On Investment Relativism Happiness or Misery More than at any time in the history of the financial markets, or so it would seem, the quest for investment success has come to center on relative performance over the short term. We have entered what we might call the age of investment relativism. All eyes seem focused on a comparison that has become as much a part of investors' lives as the daily fluctuations in the stock market. How did my equity portfolio perform relative to the Standard & Poor's 500 Composite Stock Price Index? Our happiness or misery seem to depend on how we answer that question. Some 150 years ago, the impecunious and mercurial Mr. Micawber, in Charles Dickens's David Copperfield, bestowed happiness or misery according to the following formula. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditures, 19.6. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditures, 20 pounds, 6. Result, misery. Too many mutual fund portfolio managers and shareholders now seem to operate in a system representing a new form of Micawber's formula. Market return, 17.8%. My return, 18.3%. Result, happiness. Market return, 17.8%. My return, 13.2%. Result, misery. That last set of returns, in fact, describes the shortfall of the average domestic equity mutual fund compared to the stock market, as measured by the S&P 500 index, over the past 15 years. 17.8% versus 13.2%. The 4.6 percentage point gap suggests why most equity fund managers are likely to be feeling considerable professional misery, albeit perversely along with stunning personal financial gain, as the 1990s end. While, given the great bull market, most fund investors have hardly felt much financial misery, it seems only a matter of time until they recognize not what was, but what might have been. If the question were simply, did the professional investment advisors outpace the market over the past 15 years, the answer is clear. Most advisors did not. Indeed, as a matter of basic mathematics and elementary logic, most advisors cannot outpace the market over the long run. They ought to disclose, candidly and forthrightly, indeed passionately, to shareholders and prospective investors alike, not only the absolute rates of return they have achieved, in individual years and over the long term, but how those returns compared to the returns that would have been achieved by an appropriate benchmark standard accepted by manager and investor alike as a prime measure of success over the long pull. While the Securities and Exchange Commission has required this type of comparative disclosure in fund investment reports since 1992, it is more often than not deeply buried in the text. But while the change is almost never disclosed to investors, mutual fund managers seem to have decided to shift from a long-term to a short-term focus. Indeed, a powerful focus on quarterly relative performance has developed, fostered by reporting in the media, by performance-sensitive institutional investors, and by individual investors seeking the latest leaders in short-term fund performance. Advisors have responded as you would expect. Performance is almost invariably based on a single standard, an omnipresent bogey, 
a Scottish word meaning goblin and few advisors regarded in kinder terms. The Redoubtable S&P 500 Composite Stock Price Index Curiously, we often see weekly and even daily comparisons after a significant market drop, but rarely after a sharp rally. The reason? Market indexes are, by definition, 100% invested at all times, and managers await, so far to no avail, confirmation that their cash reserves will offer significant protection in declining markets. While the 30-stock Dow Jones Industrial Average remains our basic measure of daily market swings, the market value-weighted S&P 500 is used almost invariably in making relative return comparisons over longer periods. Today, institutional pension officers scowl over their bifocals as they review the quarterly performance comparisons in regularly scheduled meetings with their investment advisors. Individual investors receive the data each quarter, either in real time on their computers or, later, shocking, in the next morning's newspaper. Such short-term focus can be only counterproductive. Portfolio managers invest not on the basis of analysis and conviction, but in relation to a market standard, gingerly shading the weights of their portfolio holdings somewhat higher or lower than those of the benchmark. In the absence of genuine managerial judgment, the implicit questions quickly follow. Is my bet, as it is usually described, the right one, or should I align my portfolio more closely to the index? A lot of casino capitalism by managers and investors alike is being labeled as investing, and betting, even betting not to lose, may be the best word to characterize a strategy of over-reliance on the composition of an unmanaged and relatively unchanging market index. Taken to extremes, the process seems to work something like this. I think Coca-Cola stock is grotesquely overvalued. But in case it keeps going up, I'm going to buy a 1.5% portfolio position for protection. Since that's less than Coca-Cola's 2% weight in the S&P 500 index, I'll have a good defensive position versus the index when Coca-Cola takes the tumble it so richly deserves. Isn't that philosophy the antithesis of professional investment management? Yet hasn't it become the formula followed by nervous portfolio managers anxious to hold their jobs? Isn't it the result of the marketing department's holding sway over the investment department? In each case, my finding would be guilty as charged. Such a closet indexing strategy is, in my view, more pervasive than most investors realize. But whether it permeates a portfolio or takes place at the margin, I've never seen it disclosed in a fund's prospectus. To the extent that it is becoming the investment of choice, the index fund is taking its rightful place within the mutual fund industry. It is the odds-on favorite to outpace three of every four managers. For the market as a whole, low-cost investing in a highly diversified portfolio of stocks, a loose but accurate description of an index fund, ineluctably beats investing in a diversified portfolio of high-cost funds over the long run. Admittedly, the S&P 500 index has had a particularly good run over the past 15 years. But the S&P 500 stocks also make up 75% of the total market. In the long run, their aggregate return should parallel the total market. An index fund targeted on the Wilshire 5000 index, of course, will match the market over the long term and the short term alike. In any event, the index fund marketplace, now dominated by S&P 500 strategies, is increasingly moving in the direction of all-market indexing. Over time, this broader strategy may well become the principal choice for institutional indexers and fund indexers alike. There is more bad news for fund managers. Another form of index-like competition, quantitative investing, is emerging, and I'm confident that it too will take its place in the field. The widespread use of quantitative techniques and computers to screen and value individual stocks and stock groups in the traditional security analyst-based management process has spread to what is called quantitative investing, computer-driven investment policies that rely rigidly and exclusively on mathematical formulas to set strategy or to select stocks for investment portfolios. We're all quants now. 
Current industry estimates place the assets managed by Quants at $100 billion, and the growth rate has been strong. Some of these quantitative strategies might fairly be described as the ultimate forms of investment relativism, but they must not be confused with closet indexing. With fully disclosed policies and strategies, they are hardly hidden in a closet. Their strategies are rigorous and controlled, not random and intuitive, and their costs are often well below conventional norms. It's far less costly to run a computer program than to employ a large portfolio research and management staff. Through a strategy typically known as enhanced indexing, such funds seek explicitly to outpace a particular market index, all the while attempting to severely limit variations from the index return, so-called tracking error. Most use sophisticated computer models to select a diversified portfolio of stocks whose characteristics are closely aligned with the target index in such areas as industry sectors and market characteristics in such areas as price earnings and market-to-book ratios. The first mutual fund in this category, begun in 1986 and operated at a cost far below industry norms, has bettered the index itself, but only slightly. The margin it achieved, however, was sufficient to give it a meaningful edge over an index fund, by reason of its costs, low as they were, in long-term accumulation. The overall evidence of success in such disciplined and or sector-neutral strategies, as they are known, is quite mixed, but my guess is that these strategies will ultimately prove attractive to investors who realize the value of indexing but can't quite enter an index fund and abandon all hope that they can identify in advance active managers who will outperform the index results. Provided that quantitative funds become available at costs competitive with those of index funds and succeed in providing extra returns, enhanced indexing may also represent an important challenge to the status quo. Faced with the new competition from index and quantitative funds, how should traditional managers respond, and what issues should shareholders consider? If closet indexing is a wrong or even a counterproductive response, as I believe it is, what is the right response? First, a given. Advisors should freely acknowledge to investors that they should be expected to outpace an agreed-on market performance standard over the long run, and that they will strive to do just that. What else is an advisor supposed to do? How else can we measure whether the economic value being created is sufficient to justify the cost of retaining the advisor in the first place? The all-embracing standard need not be, it should not be, the S&P 500 index, although it obviously would seem to be for large-cap funds that are a blend of growth stocks and value stocks. For managers who purport to have open charters to invest wherever they wish, broader all-market indexes seem most appropriate. They should no longer be virtually ignored. Chapter 12. On Asset Size Nothing fails like success. In the short span of two decades, mutual funds have grown from a mom-and-pop cottage industry to a financial behemoth. The great American mutual fund boom has multiplied equity fund assets fully 82 times, from $34 billion 20 years ago to $2.8 trillion presently. The old saying, nothing succeeds like success, surely describes the industry today. As the great 16-year bull market has soared, investors have flocked to mutual funds in numbers not even dreamed of two decades ago. But there is a contrary expression. Nothing fails like success. The massive asset size and transaction volume of mutual funds, by portfolio managers and shareholders alike, have created serious problems, along with an important set of limitations for the industry. If small is beautiful, mutual funds are not as pretty as they once were. The industry today differs not just in degree, but in kind, from what it was as recently as a decade ago. As a result, the past is unlikely to be prologue. The way we look at equity mutual funds must change to reflect today's realities and those that we will continue to face in the years ahead. The history of mutual fund performance relative to the market is not likely to be very relevant to how mutual funds perform in the future. Nonetheless, 
Despite having had the opportunity to outpace the market in an earlier era, mutual funds failed to do so by a wide margin. Mutual funds, now holding $2.5 trillion of U.S. equity securities, control more than 21% of corporate America. At the start of 1982, just before the great bull market began, when the total value of U.S. equities was $1.3 trillion, fund holdings totaled $40 billion, or just 2.8% of the total. This extraordinary eightfold increase in percentage ownership, so rarely noted, has important implications. And the control continues to grow. By the century's end, one of every four shares of stock or four of every ten shares, if we include shares held in other investment accounts run by mutual fund managers, may well be effectively controlled by mutual funds. In 1982, mutual funds constituted largely a standalone industry that was focused almost entirely on its own business. Few were units of financial conglomerates that also provided asset management services directly to individuals and institutions. Today, only three of the 25 largest fund complexes provide their services solely to mutual funds. The conglomeration of fund complexes with one another, and with banks, trust companies, insurance companies, and brokerage firms, to say nothing of railroads, glassmakers, and airlines, national and international alike, has reached epic proportions. One implication of the industry's giant size is that these dominant ownership percentages represent the big stick now carried by mutual funds and their associated asset pools in corporate governance. The funds so far have followed President Theodore Roosevelt's advice to speak softly when carrying a big stick, but their institutional brethren in the state and local government pension fund arena have shown no similar restraint. Nonetheless, it is fair to say that the latent power of fund ownership, added to the dynamic power represented by the ownership of the huge state and local asset pools, has helped bring about the truly revolutionary focus on creating shareholder economic value that has helped awaken corporate America to the responsibilities it owes its owners. In this somewhat perverse sense, funds can be said to have helped create the great boom in earnings that U.S. corporations— by focusing intently on shareholder value, have enjoyed in recent years. Another implication of the fund's giant size is that mutual fund shareholders have played an increasingly powerful role in shaping stock market returns. The increase of fund ownership from less than 3% to 21% of U.S. stocks in 16 years has meant that fund shareholders themselves have fueled the demand for stocks, which has helped drive stocks upward. But these same fund shareholders have also created new risks to market liquidity. To the extent that they demonstrate a herd instinct, shareholders could endanger the very liquidity that mutual funds pledge to offer. The fact that this obvious and implicit risk has so far manifested itself only by adding to the demand for stocks should not blind us to the reality that any significant run of fund redemptions would create downward pressure, perhaps of major dimension. The industry as a whole, given its massive size, is truly in a straitjacket. The flat-footed cheetah has become the lumbering pachyderm. Any chance, however remote, that mutual funds as a group can outpace a suitably weighted market index, one that includes large and small stocks in similar proportions to those of the industry, is gone with the wind. Put another way, if equity funds as a group are to outpace the market, the last best hope is through minimization of the fiscal drag that makes winning the game so tough. Funds could reduce advisory fees, marketing costs, and expense ratios, reduce excessive and costly portfolio turnover, and reduce the long-term drag of cash holdings, so easy to do in an age when futures contracts on market indexes are available. None of these trends has developed to date. In the highly unlikely event that they do develop, they could help improve fund returns and give more fund managers the opportunity to live up to their own professional reputations and the expectations of fund shareholders. Funds as a group would continue to trail the market by the amount of their costs, but by a slimmer margin. Such changes could help reduce the industry's return shortfall against the indexes, but given the industry's massive size, there is no longer any chance to eliminate it. 
There are three major reasons why large size inhibits the achievement of superior returns. The universe of stocks available for a fund's portfolio declines, transaction costs increase, and portfolio management becomes increasingly structured, group-oriented, and less reliant on savvy individuals. The shrinking universe of investment opportunities that comes with size is quite obvious. There are legal and practical constraints on security ownership. To ensure broad diversification, managers rarely wish to have their funds hold many investment positions in excess of 3% of fund assets. Further, because dominant ownership positions may well constrain market liquidity as shares are purchased and sold, only a rare firm will wish to have very many positions representing as much as 10% of a corporation's shares outstanding. The manager of a large portfolio could try to escape some of the problems of size by having larger numbers of holdings in smaller concentrations. The largest fund, for example, owns 483 stocks. But the performance of each holding, by definition, would have a smaller impact on the performance of the portfolio. Also, the manager could structure a strategy around industry subsets, such as Internet participants, modem manufacturers, circuit board makers, and so on, rather than pick individual stocks. But the fundamental point remains intact. Large asset size reduces drastically the number of important portfolio positions that can be included in the investable universe available to a portfolio manager of a large fund. A second factor is that the cost of portfolio transactions increases with size. Mutual fund size as such is not the problem. No transaction costs are associated with the huge long-term holdings of American Express, Walt Disney, and Gillette owned by Mr. Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, even though those positions represent, on average, fully one-half of those of the entire mutual fund industry, or of Coca-Cola, in which his 200 million shares are almost double the 112 million shares held by all funds combined. Now we see how funds can be so underrepresented in Coke. Why? Because he doesn't buy or sell them very often. The shares of Berkshire Hathaway aren't redeemable on demand, so he won't need to sell them until he wishes to do so. At his price, i.e. opportunistically. If he should want to get out in a rush, he would doubtless have to accept a considerable price sacrifice. But that is hardly his style. There seems little question that transaction costs have some direct correlation with asset size. Smart managers, and most fund managers are smart, have to be particularly alert when the assets they manage increase relative to the market. The managers must add some sort of value that exceeds their growing transaction costs. If they can't get smart, and as individuals in a group they can never all outsmart each other, they must fall further behind the cost-free returns earned on unmanaged market indexes composed of securities similar to those represented by the fund's style. The evidence strongly suggests that no extra value has been forthcoming. The third reason that large size impairs outstanding returns is less obvious, but the handicap it imposes on the managers of a fund organization is no less real. As an organization expands, the impact of an individual portfolio manager wanes and the impact of an institutional investment process waxes. No longer are there a few portfolio managers with messy desks, bright ideas, and decisive minds, supported by a handful of analysts and traders, and modest administrative backing. Now there is a horde of funds, as many as a hundred or more, plus an organization chart, an investment process, committees to approve transactions and then to appraise them, meetings, exhaustive legal and regulatory filings, red tape, and a focus on process. Who's in charge here? Rather than on judgment, what should we own? The manager who used to invest heavily in his best ideas can no longer afford to do so. Wall Street Journal columnist Roger Lowenstein is one of the few journalists who has recognized this phenomenon. He recently wrote, Picking stocks, like writing stories, is a one-at-a-time endeavor. It is done best by individuals or small groups of people sharing their ideas and buying only the very best. A small fund family managing selective portfolios can succeed as a group, 
but no large institution can order dozens of managers to outperform. The image can be branded, but not the talent. The people matter more than the name. Compared to its beginnings, the mutual fund industry is different today. Different in the aggregate, different in its power in the financial markets, different in its investment limitations, different in its costs and its impact on the stock market, different in the way its investment decisions are made and implemented. Any reliance on history as a guide to the future accomplishments of individual mutual funds and of the fund industry itself is tenuous at best. If present growth rates continue, in only a few years mutual fund managers could control perhaps four-tenths of all U.S. equities and account for as much as three-fourths of all equity transactions. Why isn't the industry more forthright about the issue of size? Why can't we face up to the fact that our burgeoning asset growth has already changed the character of most giant funds, and indeed of the industry in the aggregate? Liquidity matters, cost matters, taxes matter, and size can kill. The challenge of performance excellence is becoming more formidable and more impregnable to attainment, even by skilled professional portfolio managers. If funds won't deal with these questions, investors must persist in raising them. If left unresolved, their impact on funds' performance and future returns may be profound. No firm, I repeat, no firm, is exempt from these issues, and hence no fund investor is exempt. Investment firms and investors alike must have the wisdom to face this dissonant music. The mutual fund industry's fabulous success is living proof that nothing succeeds like success. But that rule may well be sowing the seeds of its own antithesis, nothing fails like success. Investors must consider all of the implications of investment size, not only for the funds whose shares they own, but for the industry colossus they have helped to create. Chapter 13 On Taxes The Message of the Parallax Often, a small change in vantage point can engender a large change in perception. So it is with the parallax, exemplified by the angle created by the two-and-a-quarter-inch distance between our eyes, which enables us to visualize objects in three dimensions. As I discussed in Chapter 3, mutual fund investment has four dimensions, return, risk, cost, and time. It is conventional to consider investments on the basis of return and risk, but I believe that adding cost as a third dimension provides a far better understanding of investment returns generally, and mutual fund returns in particular. Thus, I apply the principle of the parallax to mutual funds. The impact of cost is greatly magnified when we consider not only the substantial operating and transaction costs of mutual funds, but the cost of taxes as well. The profound impact of taxes on fund returns is a subject too long ignored. Fund managers may feel that they can afford to ignore it, but fund owners ignore it at their peril. With an estimated $700 billion of capital gains currently on the books in mutual fund portfolios, it is high time for the subject of taxes to receive the exposure it deserves. To be sure, an investor's goal is not simply to minimize the tax burden, but rather to achieve the highest possible net returns. Paradoxically, however, a focus on minimizing taxes seems not only not to diminish, but to enhance pre-tax returns. The tax issue is the black sheep of the mutual fund industry. Like a cousin who can't get her life together or an uncle who drinks too much, taxes are kept out of sight and out of mind. But investors cannot afford to turn a blind eye to this issue. For it is the fund shareholder who pays the taxes on a mutual fund's income dividends and on any capital gains distributions generated by the fund's constant staccato of portfolio sales, and, at least in the recent bounteous bull market, by the realization of enormous taxable capital gains. The dichotomy is that a portfolio manager's performance is measured and applauded on the basis of pre-tax return. Never mind that the Internal Revenue Service confiscates a healthy share of it. Few portfolio managers spend their time agonizing over the tax consequences of their decisions. Ever since the creation of the first mutual fund in 1924, the industry has essentially ignored the tax issue. 
Indeed, for decades, funds were sold as much on the basis of looking for more income as on the basis of total returns. In the 1940s and early 1950s, stock yields averaged 8% and bond yields averaged 2.5%. Imagine. The industry often sloughed off the difference between income dividends and capital gains distributions. They were added together to arrive at a total distribution yield, a practice not legally permitted since 1950. In recent years, as tax-deferred IRA accounts and 401k corporate retirement plans have come to the fore, tax considerations have gotten even less attention. In fact, investors in tax-deferred retirement plans, which as a group hold 40% of the assets of equity funds, are now the driving force in industry growth. Investors in these accounts need burden neither their minds nor their checkbooks with tax issues. But the owners of the other 60% of fund assets do not have the luxury of ignoring tax considerations. Each year they must pay taxes on the fund distributions they receive. Yet mutual funds do not provide adequate disclosure about the tax implications of their investment strategies, portfolio turnover expectations, and gain realization policies. Look under the Dividends, Capital Gains, and Taxes heading in a typical fund prospectus and you'll find something like the fund distributes annually substantially all of its net income after expenses and any capital gains realized from the sale of securities. Dividends and short-term gains are taxable to you as ordinary income. Distributions of long-term capital gains are taxable to you as long-term capital gains. That is proper disclosure as far as it goes, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. Investors must realize the importance of not merely minimizing taxes, but also maximizing after-tax returns. They must consider all three of the spatial dimensions of mutual fund investing, return, risk, and cost. Taxable investors must unfailingly recognize that taxes are costs, and substantial costs at that, and it is high time for mutual fund managers to do so as well. Chapter 14 on Time, The Fourth Dimension, Magic or Tyranny As Albert Einstein pointed out, we live in a universe that is not only spatial, but temporal. He identified time as the fourth dimension, and so it is in the world of investing, too. In other words, investment return has four dimensions. Three are the spatial dimensions, length, which I'll describe as reward, breadth, or risk, and depth, or cost. But there is also a temporal dimension— Time. These four dimensions are interlinked in tantalizing ways, sometimes obvious, sometimes subtle. The intelligent investor cannot afford to ignore any of them. The challenge is to weigh each of them properly in the light of the investment goals to be achieved. Reward must be given primacy as a factor in the process of wealth accumulation. Looking back at the past 15-plus years, during which mutual funds have become overwhelmingly the investment of choice for America's families— Reward almost seems taken for granted. During that period, the total stock market has garnered an astonishing annualized return of 17.2%. As a result, an investor who placed $10,000 into the stock market at the end of 1982 would now have an investment worth $117,000 if costs and taxes were ignored. Would that they could be. During this era of abundance for so many investors, building a portfolio of assets has seemed easy. As you survey the inevitably uncertain prospects for reward in the near term, which are perhaps greater at this level of the stock market than during the entire investment lifetime of most investors today, you must necessarily consider risk, the second dimension of investment return. In investment terms, risk is to reward what breadth is to length in spatial terms, the lesser of the two sides of the plane. That is not to say that risk is unimportant. It is crucial. But I simply do not accept its being counted equally with reward. Indeed, as I noted in Chapter 1, faith in the future, an essential element in investing, entails the implicit assumption that return will exceed risk. If the potential return does not exceed the potential risk, why invest at all? But risk is one of the hallmarks of equity investing, and fear of loss is often the investor's greatest concern. 
Conventionally, risk is measured with precision, albeit imperfectly, in terms of standard deviation, although that is a backward-looking measure that is more accurately a measure of price volatility rather than risk. The two are not exactly the same. The first two elements, reward and risk, are well-accepted dimensions of investment return, indeed, usually to the complete exclusion of the third dimension. For example, how often do we read risk-reward ratio rather than risk-reward-cost ratio? Yet the impact of cost both on reward and on risk cannot possibly be overstated. In the investment world, the importance of time in shaping returns has been honored more in the breach than in the observance more in theory than in practice. We speak of the value of long-term investing, and we say kind words about long-term investors. But when we ask to list them, it is hard to name two. Who comes to mind after Warren Buffett? In the mutual fund industry, as noted at the outset of this book, we clearly invest for the short term. Fully one-third of equity fund portfolios have turnover of more than a 100% each year. If our marketing policies and fund supermarkets are any indication, we seek short-term investors, too. And we get them. Shareholders are turning over their own equity funds at an average annual rate of more than 30%. These numbers reflect incredible mobility. In both cases, they reflect foolish short-run strategies. In the search for investment return, I have no doubt that they are counterproductive. Looking across large classes of shareholders, I sometimes suspect that wealthy private investors may be the only significant group that prizes a long-term strategy and practices low portfolio turnover. And I am hardly above suggesting that the reliance on such a strategy may be precisely why these families are wealthy in the first place. Experience need not be painful to teach a powerful lesson, and fund investors and managers alike should learn from that experience. Among all strategies, market index strategies have the longest time horizons, and all market index changes only at the glacial pace of the entire market. Initial offerings of stocks are small in relative weight, and when firms vanish by merger or bankruptcy, no portfolio transactions ensue. The annual portfolio turnover of an all-market index fund rarely exceeds 2 to 3 percent, essentially an average holding period of 33 to 50 years. That long horizon is surely a significant factor in the formidable relative pre-tax returns that index funds have provided, as well as in their almost unparalleled superiority in providing after-tax returns. Almost as striking as the interplay between time and reward is the relationship between time and risk, particularly in the stock market. As your time horizon increases, the variability of stock market returns declines. As the years roll on, compounding moderates market risk. Furthermore, the risk of earning the stock market's long-term return declines quite steeply during surprisingly short spans. The mutual fund industry almost never shows the relationship between time and cost. If shown, the chart would be a rather disturbing one. It would present the same time period, the same stock market return of 12%, and the same $931,000 end result. But a second line would show the results assumed for a 10% mutual fund return, the market return reduced by estimated all-in annual equity fund expenses of 2%. At 10%, the line still grows, nicely sweeping upward as the years pass, but to a 40-year total of only $453,000, less than half of the value generated by the stock market's return. Over the full 40-year period, costs have confiscated fully $478,000. Put another way, more than half the market's return has been consumed by the industry's costs. When navigating the financial markets, the long-term investor must keep in mind the four basic dimensions of long-term return, reward, risk, cost, and time, and must apply them to every asset class. Never forget that these four dimensions are remarkably interdependent. If your basic objectives are long-term in nature, awareness of this interdependence will give you a strong advantage in planning the voyage of the flagship represented by your own investment accounts. During the long voyage that you take to reach your goal of accumulating capital, the financial markets will inevitably experience cross-currents, tidal shifts, high winds, rough seas, and rugged storms. 
Today's bright skies, sprightly breezes, and calm waters won't last forever. But those of you who are looking to far horizons, who are able to accept a bit more short-term risk in the pursuit of enhanced long-term returns, who are conscious of the destructive power of cost, and who are able to use time to its highest advantage, will win the battle for investment survival, if only you have the wit and the wisdom to stay the exciting course that lies ahead. This is Grover Gardner for Wiley Audio. Thank you for listening. This audiobook is a co-production of Penton Overseas and Audio Scholar and is based upon the book entitled Common Sense on Mutual Funds, written by John C. Bogle. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.